Ba, 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 ba. All right. Let's see if we're streaming. I have not done something like this uh, ever in a while. Um, I think I'm live. I'm watching the YouTube stream to see if anything actually starts to happen. I've got OBS going. Let's see if it happens. Okay, here we go. Great. Yeah, looks like I'm live. That's the delay <laughs> from me saying I'm live to now being over here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and all that good stuff. Uh, we are going to get started here, and uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a great little session today chatting about 5.3, VR in general, Unreal Fest, uh, tacos, whatever you guys want to chat about. So uh, just let me know that you can hear me okay and that I'm not just speaking to a completely muted uh, environment to a bunch of ghosts, so to speak. And we're good. Great. Thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cool. So, you know, a lot of stuff I want to cover today. I've got a nice little agenda. So I'll basically just hang out until I pass out because there hasn't been a lot of sleep this week. But some of the things I want to cover is, uh, first of all, this lovely little demo we have open, uh, which is a little bit of a teaser for this year's production of Christmas Carol VR, something Agile Lens, my company's done for the past couple years and definitely plans on doing again this year. And it's going to be a heck of a cool VR experience showing off the best qualities of Unreal Engine 5.3, uh, assuming we get a MetaQuest plugin for that. And also we are able to um, sorry, I got to turn off my Slack because I'm getting messages from Epic, as a matter of fact. Uh, 5.3, we need to upgrade the MetaXR plugin to 5.3, and we need the in-world AI plugin in 5.3, and uh, then we'll be over there, and that's going to be great. I also want to show off some of the stuff going on inside a couple of my Unreal Engine 5.3 projects so we can actually see things that are working, things that aren't working, things that are like on the tip of the tongue of being really excellent. And uh, the whole time, I'm going to monitor the chat. And we've got some cool folks from Agile Lens here. Uh, we've got Kevin. We've got Dante. We've got Marshall, I believe. And uh, feel free to say hi to them and ask questions. And we'll just have a jolly old time talking. We got Wit Sellers, too. Fantastic. Um, just about any fun stuff going on in the general world of VR, specifically at Agile Lens, anything like that. So to start, we're just going to open up with this great little demo that um, Dante's put together. On the left, we have Charles Dickens. And by the way, Dante just handed this off to me, but this is like a huge team effort. We've got uh, June on our team and Marshall and me and a, a whole bunch of people that have been working on this um, for a while. Slack, go away. <laughs> I got to kill it. Um, and so what you're seeing here is I am in VR right now, and I can see our two metahumans here. And we've got a few different things going on inside of this experience. So we've got some buttons. And what's kind of cool is um, June and Dante spent a bunch of time figuring out how to properly map a UI to the VR spectator camera. And I'll show you today some ways that we can start to enhance the VR spectator camera as well beyond what we have out of the box. So I'm in the spectator camera right now. I can use you know, WASD QE to move around. If I've got an Xbox controller, I can do it with this too, which is great. I love the zoom in, zoom out. Although do notice that the UI uh, does change with it. So just keep that in mind. I can see the UI in VR as well, which is kind of neat. And we've got some buttons. So I can click some buttons um, while I'm in VR uh, using the mouse. I could also start to access some of these things in VR if I wanted to, but it's nice to think about having a bit of this handoff thing. So this is a bit of a test we've been doing. Again, just a little teaser for some of the new things in Christmas Carol this year. Um, obviously, we have MetaHuman Animator at our disposal this year. We've got 5.3 and, and our, our first time actually using like Lumen and Nanite and all that because even as of last year, we still felt like we had to stay in 4.27. Um, but let's start. Let's start with a little introduction by uh, Ari Tar, who's always playing Scrooge and Dickens for us. And here's a little snippet, a little recorded sequence um, that is done in MetaHuman Animator. Um, we were showing this at Virtual Reality Toronto Film, not Film Festival, VRTO over in Toronto a little while ago. Ari and I were both there showing off some version of this. But I'm going to hit Start Sequence. I'm just going to be quiet for a minute, collect my thoughts, and we'll just watch what's happening uh, on the screen. And I will also toggle back and forth between my VR view as well as the spectator camera view here. So I'm obviously the little glowing um, junior mint there, the pink one. And here we go. And Cratchits danced about the table. Then in came little Bob, the father, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch. 
and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. And how did little Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold and better. Somehow, sitting by himself so much, he thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told him this and trembled more when he said that tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. Mrs Cratchit left the room to take the pudding up and bring it in. In half a minute she entered, flushed but smiling proudly. Oh, a wonderful pudding. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim. The ghost led him straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled Oops. and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling. I lost Up my mouse. Rose, <laughs> Mrs. Cr here, I'll go out and go back in. So this is just running in the project. So yeah, uh, it looks great. It feels great uh, compared to what we were doing with MetaHumans in 4.27. I can't emphasize enough. Hey, do we got Kent by in here? Hey, Kent, that's awesome. Uh, compared to what we were doing with MetaHumans in 4.27, there's a huge benefit here. Now, you think I've shown you everything. No, 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 we got a few more phases to this. So what we have here is this dumb little avatar <laughs> that Meta gives you in their movement sample. Uh, with the Meta XR plugin. It's not a Meta human. It's not the actual like Meta Facebook Oculus avatars. It's some other like bastardized creature. And so you can, like you can do all sorts of stuff with this, but it's not useful if you want to actually have you know your own good avatars. So in the past, we've used uh, Live Link Face, this free app, in order to connect over here. Um, <laughs> I want Shane and Ken to connect. That's excellent. Please do continue to talk in the chat. Uh, so what you're going to have here is, in the past, we've always had it so our actors had to use Live Link Face, this free app that you can download on iOS. And that gives, you know, pretty good facial capture, uh, although you can't necessarily do like left and right eye, uh, to do a live performance. So you just saw something processed through MetaHuman Animator, great for something pre-recorded. Then the live side, um, Live Link Face is great, but if you're an actor, if you're a performer doing virtual reality theater or whatever we want to call that medium these days, uh, what you end up with is something that feels a little bit disconnected from your audience, right? You're there and you're looking at your meshed face. And then, you know, what we tried to do with Ari was we'd like kind of give him a bit of a cave and give him different monitors so he could kind of look around and have a sense of where everyone is, was, but it's not the same. So what we've done is we've taken the Meta Quest Pro avatar thing there, which does detect face and eye tracking and all that good stuff. And we've in a very janky way, been able to link it over here. So you see that we've got these buttons here to uh, allow this to be connected either to Live Link or to Quest Pro. So check this out. So now I am controlling Charles Dickens uh, with my Meta Quest Pro, which is neat because this isn't something that Meta has, you know, designed this to be able to do. Um, and I also may or may not have the hands connected as well. Um, but yes, the key thing that we're trying to show here is the fact that I'm now able to allow our performers uh, like Ari, like Debbie, who once again will be reprising their roles this year in Christmas Carol, to be inside the actual headset and connect with their audience, look at them, interact with them. Um, the audience will also have a way this year to engage directly with the performers, or sorry, with the, yeah, the audience and the performers will be able to engage more directly. So uh, Ari mostly, because Debbie will be in character the whole time, Ari will be able to respond to the audience as Dickens. And that's going to be really cool to see how that all comes together. And by the way, it is still such a trip to uh, be in VR and actually get close to yourself and watch, you know, as I blink and puff out my cheeks and all that. Drives me crazy that with the MetaQuest um, avatar, you can't stick out your tongue. Ah, <laughs> it's, sometimes you really need to stick out your tongue. It's important, but it feels really good um, being inside VR, seeing this. I could go over and do the same thing um, with Scrooge, or, you know, I could have Scrooge doing some other animation. I could have him connected to Live Link Face. We're really just trying to build out a whole set of different tools for our toolbox. Um, oops, you can't see what I see. 
uh, tools for our toolbox for not just the work we do, but live performers everywhere. We really hope that soon we'll be able to start just offering some of these things to anyone who wants to take a cool metahuman they made, whether they want to do like VTubing or, you know, an actual theater performance. Uh, we see a very bright future for putting all this together. We also want to take advantage of things like in in-world AI, we've got this fun use of the in-world AI plugin using Ari's voice and likeness, all with his permission, all with compensation. And as part of that, um, we actually have a system in there where in-world has set up a way to do emotions. And so we actually are going to have um, something similar probably for our performers where they can do a bit of a slider if they want to hit different kinds of emotions. So anyway, that's a quick flyby of uh, some of what's going on here. Um, and I hope that's interesting. Now, let me just see if there's any questions and then we'll dive more into uh, an, a full on Unreal Engine 5.3 project because spoiler alert for anyone who didn't look up here, that's still 5.2. Um, one thing I'll mention right off the bat that I've been able to do in 5.3 with this kind of stuff is I'm able to use hair strands, uh, grooms, so to speak, instead of hair cards. And so if I zoom in real close here, um, you'll see that actually what's going on here is these are actually planes of geometry that have, you know, basically textures on them because it's much less expensive to do that kind of thing in VR. Hair strands look amazing, but in the past, it's always either crashed Unreal um, or it's uh, been something you only see in one eye. So I've been showing some stuff with like the Meerkat demo from Weta and all that. The grooms and all that are actually able to work in both eyes with the right settings. But if I go over here right now and I type in uh, use cards instead of strands. Right now, that's set to one. If I set to zero, it might crash. Let's see if we can crash the engine. Ready? Uh, oh, no, it didn't crash. Okay, all right. Now, yeah, okay, but it doesn't look quite right in VR. Um, and actually, I mean, it doesn't really look like it changed over here. I think those are still hair cards. Anyways, let's get over into another project. Um, I've got a few things laid out on the desktop here for stuff we can go through. And again, just feel free to like ask questions as we uh, go along there. Yeah, thank you, Dante. Dante mentions that'll all be ready as soon as we can get the plugin updated for 5.3. Uh, okay, so let's go through a few things. Let's start with this fun uh, project I've been putting together. Actually, you know what? Before that, before that, let's jump right into the electric dream sample. This is something pretty much anyone can dive right into if they want. The electric dream sample is updated for 5.3. And there's some really fun things you can start to do with this on your own because I can't release the big demo project I'm doing as a project because there's too many like marketplace assets and things like that in there. But this is a sample anyone could download and get started with on their own if they wanted to. Be a little bit of an opportunity to talk about some of the new and exciting things uh, that we now have access to in 5.3. The most important one, let's just get this out of the way real quick. Um, let's actually open up the Unreal Engine portal or not portal, uh, it, it's at like a website called Portal, Portal Product Board, and just look really quickly at some of the things on here. Uh, so Nanite and Lumen, very important that those now can be done as a single pass stereo instance. That wasn't true before. Very heavy to do uh, VR that used Lumen or Nanite. Now, much, much, much cheaper. And I've had people tell me who have downloaded the demo that I've uh, showcased in some of my previous videos, because I do have some Dropbox links to some of those things. They've said they, they, they've been able to run those demos on an RTX, uh, sorry, not even an RTX, a GTX 1080, which is great. So that's awesome. Uh, Kent, Dante works for me. Dante's with me. <laughs> so the, the Agile Lens team who's in the chat right now is uh, Dante, Marshall, uh, Kevin, Madeline. Um, let me see if I missed anyone. Wit. Yeah, we got some cool people here. And so here we go. So here is that Electric Dream sample. Here's the tiny one. Let's go crazy. Let's jump right into the big one, the big environment, which should be this one right here, Electric Dreams ENV. Huge procedurally generated environment, super, super heavy. Um, you do, if you're going to go beyond this little map, which is the PCG close range one, you do want to be on a more powerful computer. I am on an RTX uh, 4090 here. So this is a pretty beefy workstation. But what's cool about everything going on with Instant Stereo is that it does allow a lot of this stuff to scale to lower end devices. And if you start to crank down things like your VR pixel density, um, some of your um, 
SG stuff, the, the, the settings we'll have over here, the scalability settings, you can get things to work better. Yes, thank you. Looking very good, confirming I'm not lying. Uh, they were able to get some of these demos working on a 1080 Ti. So this will also be the first year, uh, going back to Christmas Carol, that instead of forcing everyone to experience Christmas Carol online through pixel streaming or an NVIDIA Cloud XR app that has to be sideloaded, which has a lot of friction, we are just gonna let people download the experience probably through Steam or the Epic Game Store. We have to figure out how that's going to work with our AI components, but we will let people actually run the experience this year from their computer. Um, also, all the MetaQuest Pro eye tracking, face tracking stuff you just saw, uh, we have actually gotten that to work with multiplayer, which is great. So we actually are, we're, we're starting with that dummy Oculus avatar, literally the like white mannequin dummy. We're taking all that facial data for the performer and moving it onto a metahuman. And then we're broadcasting all that data so that anyone who's participating in the show then also gets to see that data. So it's a very, uh, I want—I don't wanna say convoluted, but it's a very complex system and we're happy that that's working and we're only in September and the show won't be until you know end of November um, and December. So that's gonna be fun. While this is opening, um, let's go ahead and look briefly at this roadmap again. Uh, sparse volume textures, uh, I'm, Disappointed to tell you that Marshall on our team was just doing some tests with this right before we started and they look amazing when you see them cinematically. Right now, they're only working in your left eye and they seem to be kind of like blah, like they don't look great. So for now, sparse volume textures and all that crazy Niagara stuff you've seen from like Jenga effects and all that, don't look for that for VR. Um, substrate, substrate materials look amazing in VR. I'm gonna try to zoom in on one of the opal materials here and just basically ooh and ah at you for how good it looks seeing uh, all that complex, you know, shader stuff, shader complexity. <laughs> uh, virtual shadow maps are, are more efficient looking better. Uh, hair and grooms, as I just said, you now can get those to work in the left and the right eye. Um, I also have DLSS running in here. So we've been working with uh, Bella, who is uh, Battle Axe VR on Twitter, and Bella was able to upgrade the DLSS 3 dot five plugin which right now only exists for unreal engine 5.2 over into 5.3 and so all the demos i'm showing you today i also have dlss running at ultra performance and that of course is giving another monumental performance boost on top of everything that uh, instant stereo is doing uh cool okay let's scroll through this really quick um anything that's really important for vr so xr xr scribe so let me give a quick shout out to my pals over at NVIDIA. Um, they, for a little while, have had something called NVIDIA VCR, uh, which is a lot like XR Scribe. So let me just post a link of this in the chat. Boop -a -doop -a -doop. And I'll just actually come over to here real quick. So what both XR Scribe and NVIDIA VCR do is they allow you to easily record and play back your VR session. This is great for debugging. If you uh, you know want to go through like a certain sequence of events, like I move forward and I uh, rotate the joystick and then I look around, like, and then you want to play that back over and over without putting on a VR headset over and over. It's really helpful in that capacity. XR Scribe is like that, except some of the differences are that XR Scribe, of course, is only for Unreal Engine. NVIDIA VCR uh, plugs right into Steam VR and works with any kind of open XR interface. Uh, Vive trackers are supported with VCR. They're not supported with XR Scribe yet. XR Scribe at the moment, I believe, um, does not work with actual input. It's mostly just for looking around. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a good thing to start to play with. I don't think there's a lot of documentation yet. I'm sure there'll be more about it at Unreal Fest. Uh, last year at Unreal Fest, I kind of gave the, the keynote VR talk. This year it'll be Victor Broden, which is amazing. He's incredibly smart and is right here at the top of all the kind of stuff that you see released from Epic related to XR. For anyone who doesn't know, he also made like, you know, the VR template and a lot of the core functionality in there. Um, so just a few quick things about what we have right here. So gazed track gaze tracked foveated variable rate shading experimental that is quite a mouthful so this is something that uh, marshall also determined last night does not work in desktop vr but does work in standalone so if you are building a standalone vr app um gaze tracked foveation so something like the MetaQuest pro and i'm sure for something like the apple vision pro where you can actually like look around and have that tracked automatically it's great to know that that's no longer going to be tied to you know, the, the Vario SDK or the, the Meta SDK um, that can just work through the OpenXR method. Uh, and then even if you don't have the eye tracking set up, you still do have some pretty good automatic foveation where it can kind of like compress and, you know, expand 
um, what you're going to see just to try to give a, a meaningful performance boost. There's also this nice little CVAR for uh, foveation preview one, uh, which will actually show you like where the foveation is happening if you want to enable that. Uh, also a note, so we found out that these, I think these are the commands you actually want. If you look at the 5.3 release notes, and that's the reason I'm over here instead of the release notes, it's actually giving you the incorrect CVARs. So if you want to use these, make sure you do it here. Uh, pausing for questions real quick. Uh, Pascal says, is substrate glass better now without weird reflection on Windows? Um, I will be talking about Windows. Windows are still a little bit of a problem. Yes. Uh, and thank you, Marshall, for confirming. This is right. The release notes are wrong. Hopefully the release notes will be updated soon. Here's what I mentioned about single pass stereo rendering for Nanite and Lumen. These are both great. Uh, and it's also nice that you can turn them off if you need to. If you're like, it's causing something weird, you can set these values, either of them to zero, and then Lumen slash Nanite becomes more expensive. But maybe there's certain moments, certain scenes, you could do this triggered by like a certain post-process volume, for example, where it's like there's a thing that just isn't looking right with uh, the single pass version. And so you just turn the double pass version back on and then can turn it back off as needed. So great when you can control things with CVARs. Um, I haven't played much with the new AR improvements, but I hope that's better. AR was kind of broken in Unreal uh, starting in 5.1. So I think we're in better shape now. Um, we've been working on a pretty cool AR course that uh, should be something that I think we're going to be able to share soon. A very quick note on like my relationship with Epic directly. So I am an Unreal Engine authorized instructor. Um, I do a lot of partnership work with Epic doing things like teaching, you know, important clients and all that. And typically that is all behind the unrealengine.com training uh, paywall, I guess you could say. So most of the courses that uh, June on my team and I develop, those end up uh, in a place where you can only access them if you are, you know, a company that Epic is going to be doing some important work with and bringing in for this kind of training. So here's a bunch of the courses. We've made like, I don't know, 15 of these so far over the past couple of years. Now, uh, I always feel bad when people are like, hey, how do I check out one of your courses? And I say, you kind of can't. Like there's not a clean way to uh, allow you to see like the work that we're doing in, in XR or anything like that over here. This was one of the reasons why at Unreal Fest last year, I really insisted on doing kind of a version of my intro to VR course just to try to get some of that content out there more publicly. Um, things like intro to augmented reality, architecture collaborative reviews, the variant manager pixel streaming. These are, most of these are actually courses that, that we developed. That being said, um, if you go to, this is like very much a placeholder page right now, but if you go to agilelens.com slash UE training, like this isn't like a real thing yet, but we are going to actually start offering courses. And once Agile Lens as a company becomes an authorized Unreal Engine training center, uh, which won't be hard to do once we get enough interest from people, then we are actually going to be able to access most of the courses that are over here. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because it means soon, hopefully, uh, I and, and others at Agile Lens will be able to start sharing some of this content with the public, offering courses that, that include all this. We'll do some for free, some will be paid, but as Agile Lens makes its way to becoming an Unreal Engine authorized training partner, that will be nice. So. Um, we want to just set this up as like a real newsletter, but for the moment, like if you do just want to come over to here and, you know, add your name, we'll put you on a list of like people who are interested in Agile Lens training, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Hey, Soren. Thanks, Soren. No worries. Enjoy your guests. Have a good weekend. Um, yeah, I'm just going to keep hanging out and, and going through whatever I can here. So as long as people are able to hang out, awesome. If you watch the live stream later, awesome. I'm just happy to be a part of this lovely community. Um, I've been in VR now for over 10 years, and I am constantly blown away by how wonderful everyone here is. Great, Madeline. I'm glad Madeline uh, is signing up for the <laughs> courses that we're going to have here. This is some of the like examples of things we might teach. Uh, okay, so let's see back over here. Uh, XR Scribe plugin I mentioned. There's a little bit of information about that. XR Base Refactor. Um, the takeaway I have from this, and I'm sure Victor will talk more about this at Unreal Fest, is just that in general, XR plugins are like a little more optimized now. Things should be uh, doing things uh, more likely. Wow, cool. Kent and Shane. Uh, awesome. Would love to have you guys sign up. And NDN. Excellent. That's great, guys. Always good to see interest in this sort of stuff. Um, I just finished recording a course like at 4 a.m. this morning about 
uh, Unity and Unreal and going back and forth between the two. And it's been a while since I've been in Unity. So thanks to Wit on our team also for helping uh, me figure out a way to like export FBXs from Unity and bring them over to Unreal and vice versa. That will be part of an event at Spatial IO on Sunday. And then I'm sure they'll let me like post the recording um, online after the event. But anyone who's in New York City, um, there is an event for that. And actually anyone from the Agile Lens team, if you want to grab that link and put that in the chat, because I don't have it handy, would love to see some people at that event on Sunday. It's for uh, Digital Fashion Week in New York City and yeah, being hosted with our pals over at Spatial IO. Um, oh my God, that name. Uh, Skrieg, Skrieg says, this has been asked a billion times, but I'm curious of your own opinion on hardware and headsets. Which hardware configurations have you had the best experience uh, within UE5? Uh, yeah, so, okay, this is such a loaded question. I'll, I'll give the, the short version, which is right now, the headset I use the most is this one, the MetaQuest Pro. A lot of that has to do with general comfort, with the eye tracking, with the face tracking. Um, we also have developed a bit of a, a, let's call it a nice relationship with Meta and some key people at Meta who have been really helpful with some of the roadblocks we've been hitting. Um, for many, many years, I felt really driven kind of crazy by some of the things that weren't working in Meta headsets. I mean, even right now in the latest update here, my controller keeps saying I can be here like swinging my controller around and I can see the controller's tracking and it's telling me my controller's not tracking. So I have this constant pop-up that's just like bugging me about this not working. Um, you know, are we going to get a Quest Pro or Quest 3? Of course, if there's a Quest Pro 2, we get it, of course. Um, thank you, thank you, Wit, for, uh, oh, sorry, Wit, did you actually post that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so other headsets that I've, I've liked. Um, I, I love the XR, uh, the Vive XR Elite. I think it's a fantastic headset. I love the form factor. I love just doing it in like sunglasses mode and dangling a little earring of like a USB pack under it so that that works really well. Uh, I've got a Vario XR3 here, which is beautiful, incredible for things like, you know, an art museum where you want to see everything up close and all sorts of fine textured detail. Um, yeah. Um, and sorry, just because I'm, I'm getting distracted by the chat. Uh, Wit, you posted a thing that says New York City meetup link on Sunday pointing up, but I don't see the actual link. Maybe it's just not showing up in my like OBS version of the chat, but just want to note that I do not see the link yet. Um, so yeah, Vario, Vive, um, my favorite person at HTC is actually no longer there right now. So that makes me a little bit sad. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the MetaQuest Pro, it's, it's the best headset for now. Uh, very excited for Apple Vision Pro, especially if we get some meaningful uh, Unreal support, though it is a good excuse for me to get back into my, my Unity roots. I did use nothing but Unity from 2013 to 2017, really, and then I started to dive more into Unreal and then tried to do both for a long time. Yeah, I have seen Dilmer diving more into Unreal. We've been having some fun conversations about it. Dilmer is an incredible asset to the community, and it's been fun <laughs> drawing him over more to like, oh, you should show people how to do this thing in Unreal. And I think in particular, when we can show both things together, um, you know, how they, they work together and how it's not necessarily a competition. They can both do a lot of the same things. Um, that's great. That's a lot of what I was trying to cover in my video uh, early this morning is like most of the things you want to do, you can do them in either engine. It's kind of like Maya versus 3ds Max or something like that or versus Blender where uh, it, there's just kind of different ways of going about it. Um, and, you know, some different price points to consider. Okay, I want to get into actual VR. So let me look really quickly if there's anything else I want to mention here. Um, Packaging for all Meta devices can be achieved now by enabling the package for Meta Quest devices checkbox and project settings. That's cool. Uh, mobile preview on Vulkan RHI is now using multi-view extension natively instead of mobile multi-view emulation. Um, that's good because mobile preview was also a little bit broken. Um, do you have a link to get MetaQuest Pro face tracking to work as PC Steam HMD? Um, I can just show you really quickly how to do that. I mean, you need the MetaQuest plugin, um, but then all you really have to do is in the headset, you have to go and enable face tracking, eye tracking, et cetera. And then over in like your project settings where you have the MetaQuest plugin, you know, I would type in Meta XR or Meta, um, or are they calling it Oculus in here? It's very confusing. There's Meta XR. And there should be a little area where we can say that we want to support things like face tracking and eye tracking. Yeah, here's kind of all the settings over here. Oh, the links are off for the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, weird. I So I guess I can post links, but other people can't. That's annoying. Uh, try doing like the weird thing where you like space it out. So it's like, here's the period and here's other stuff separated. Um, if I figure out how to turn the links on, I will do that. 
Um, I, by the way, am not used to live streaming. People think I'm very tech savvy. I like have never done anything quite like this before. And I've had to like relearn a lot of OBS stuff this morning to be like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to see the chat? Usually if I'm part of a live stream, there are other people handling it. So this is the first time I'm, you know, kind of flying solo. I kind of like, let me know what you think of what I ended up doing with my green screen in the background. Totally by accident. I was like, I'm not going to bother with green screen. And I was just going to have a normal view. And then I saw the OBS uh, by my old settings was keen out just like the draped curtains. And I think it's it's kind of a cool effect. I, I kind of like it. Um, yeah. So anyways, over here in the project settings uh, for Meta XR, um, first of all, definitely want to highly recommend the, the performance and platform windows. I, I've mentioned this in my other talks, but uh, sorry, no, the performance window. Um, even if you're not using a Meta XR device, this is a really cool way to very quickly determine uh, if you have anything that's kind of a red flag for your project, if you're targeting PC VR versus mobile VR, it'll be like, hey, you've got a bunch of dynamic lights. You've got some crazy post-process settings going on. You have some very expensive translucent shaders. It's like a nice quick little uh, introduction to optimizing your scene for VR. Um, yes, Dante says uh, there's some permissions in the beta of the Oculus desktop app that need to be enabled. Yes, thank you. Let me show that too. So kind of there's three steps to getting all the face tracking stuff to work for something like a MetaQuest Pro. One is in the actual headset. There's like a toggle for natural facial expressions and hand tracking and eye tracking and all that. And then over in your settings here, you need to go over to beta and you need to make sure that you are enabling developer runtime features. And then we have all this stuff, pass through, eye tracking, natural facial expressions. You don't need the SharePoint cloud data. Uh, People have asked me, by the way, recently about shared spatial anchors. We've tried so hard to get shared spatial anchors to work. Uh, we have this project in Austin that some of you know about that is using like an insane amount of OptiTrack equipment to track people in the same space. And if only shared spatial anchors and point cloud in Meta was as reliable as, as we wish it was, um, we'd be in really good shape. But nope. so for a little local multiplayer arena experience, we have to use OptiTrack equipment to make all that happen. Hopefully that improves soon, uh, yeah. So hand tracking, by the way, is just on. You don't even have to enable it. It's not even considered like a developer feature. Um, and something I do really like is just how easy it is now to get hand tracking to work in a desktop app that used to be much more complicated. Uh, over in the Unreal Engine project settings side, uh, dash, auto enabled, yeah, splash screen. If you want to have a splash screen, keep that in mind. Um, MetaQuest devices, you know, MetaQuest Pro, MetaQuest 2. If you install the latest version of the Meta XR SDK, there's also a MetaQuest 3 option here now. Um, and that is under, just to make sure people have this link as well, uh, Unreal Engine integration, here we go. Boy, Meta really needs to update their documentation. Everything they're showing on this page, by the way, is still doing things like saying, like, put this in your Unreal Engine 5.0 folder. No, but this is part for 5.2. All the documentation is showing things that are um, from 4.27, which is crazy. But anyway, this is the package. If you download this, it's ready now for MetaQuest 3, um, which, you know, I think we all feel is, is very much on the horizon. Uh, sp spatial anchors from which provider, Shane says. So we've only tried doing it in a meaningful way from um, Meta. Uh, we we played a little bit with the Azure versions, Azure Spatial Anchors, and I know that someone was telling me about there's some other SDK or GitHub or something that starts to combine like all the Spatial Anchors into one magic one-stop shop. Uh, that is something I'd love to explore if we find some time for it. It would be great to do like reliable local multiplayer in a big 5,000 square foot area um, and not have to rely on OptiTrack equipment. By the way, that, that project for Four Seasons in Austin, Texas, uh, I'll be giving a talk with that alongside some of the other key members of the team, Neil Griffiths from DBox and Jose Urab from PureBlink. Um, that's gonna be a really cool talk. Two talks I'm, I'm a part of at Unreal Fest, that one about Four Seasons, and then kind of on behalf of Epic, I'll be giving a MetaHuman Animator Lab um, in, a, in one of the laboratories. I think there's only room for 30 people to do that because everyone gets their own computer. So try to sign up for that if you can. Um, can you snag the link out of Slack? Yeah, sure. I just disabled Slack because I was getting pinged by uh, some folks at Epic who I owe some <laughs> Unreal Engine or Unreal Fest stuff to. And I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to do it today. I'm so sorry. But yeah, let me just grab that link real quick because it's confusing. Um, da, 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 da. There it is. Networking brunch at Spatial plus Luma. So here we go. Um, yeah, and any any other links to my Agile Lens folks that we want to share in the chat, I guess just drop it in that our general channel, and I will paste it for everyone. 
Um, Shane says, when Shane was at Magic Leap, uh, they made a spectator mode that had cross-platform support, but it's only in Unity. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff I still find works a lot better in Unity than in Unreal, uh, unfortunately. I wish there was more parity between the two engines. Um, seems like the Unity plugins get updated faster, and it's just a more robust ecosystem, especially when it comes to VR sometimes. Um, are you running the consumer-grade card here or workstation card? I have an RTX... 4090 here. Um, we do have uh, computers at the Agile Lens office sporting like, you know, RTX A6000s and things like that. Uh, thanks NVIDIA for <laughs> kindly <laughs> providing us with those cards that we would not be able to afford on our own. Back over into here. Nothing else there. Um, I just wanted to keep finishing this up. Uh, late latching, that can give you a little bit of a, a boost sometimes. Uh, hand tracking support, you can say controllers and hands, so you can switch between them. Hand tracking frequency is fine. Do you want to enable pass-through? Do you want to enable spatial anchors? Uh, I totally forget what scene support is. Someone maybe can talk about that in the app. And then finally, to get to the question that was asked like 10 minutes ago, body tracking enabled, eye tracking enabled, face tracking enabled. So those would start to connect everything here. Although, I'm going to direct this at Dante. So Dante, uh, face tracking was not enabled, and yet we just saw that I was doing facial tracking. Is that just because we've got some kind of like override going in here uh, that is, you know, just saying like, yes, we do want to use face tracking, even though that's not set up in the project settings? Because um, a lot of times in Unreal, that is the case. You have like the project settings, which are not what's possible in the engine. It's like what your defaults are. And then things like post-process volumes and sometimes, you know, components and SDKs will override um, the settings you have over there. <laughs> By the way, the reason my outliner is over here right now is because I was showing in my Unity to Unreal demo how you could start to make Unreal look like Unity or vice versa if you just liked the layout of those windows a little bit more um, in one scenario versus the other. Okay. Uh, doc, 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 doc. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, Dante says that's a great question. So I don't know. We, we technically have it disabled here, but it was working, so that's fine. Um, dynamic resolution. Yes, I would generally do dynamic resolution, which would start to automatically go between different pixel densities. That is the CVAR VR dot pixel density, um, you know, 1.0. If you go up to like 2, everything's going to be super sharp, but probably super slow. Um, pixel density minimum, sometimes I'd go down like as low as 0.6 and things can still look okay. Uh, maximum, if you've got higher end hardware, something like 1.6 is going to be good. But that's really nice uh, to just have that happen automatically instead of trying to futz with it manually. Foveated rendering, high or high top, you know, or make it dynamic and it'll figure it out all on its own. And there is support eye tracked foveated rendering. Um, which is grayed out here, and I'm trying to think about why, because we do have the Meta XR plugin. Why would that be grayed out? Dante, Marshall, someone might have an idea. Um, but yeah, this is all within the, the Meta XR plugin, so this is all specific to the Meta XR plugin. Um, I forget entirely what happens when you enable experimental features, but that should make some things possible. Um, so to note, this foveated method stuff gets overridden, or this overrides the other foveated rendering stuff that's just uh, connected to OpenXR. So if I do just the OpenXR plug-in, which should be in here, OpenXR. Oh, and it only says OpenXR input. Do we not have the OpenXR plugin on? Ooh, that would be trippy. Uh, hey, <laughs> there's the uh, Agile Lens utility nodes. Marshall's been doing a great job putting together this, this GitHub, which anyone can download, uh, which just has some useful things that we're using more and more in our work. GitHub.com slash Agile Lens. Um, let me throw that in the chat real quick. Cool. Um, do we not have OpenXR on? We do, um, but there's no settings in there. That's weird. Project settings, there's only OpenXR input. Yeah, because I was just going to show that there are other foveated rendering settings, but um, I don't know, maybe the Oculus... Oh, there they are. Yeah, foveate. Maybe maybe I did like foveated uh, and I didn't do foveation. Usually when you're looking for a setting, it's good to like not type the whole word in case there's different like gerunds at the end and that kind of thing. But anyway, the meta XR version of all the foveation uh, overrides anything you might put on over here, you know. So even though these look kind of similar, just note that this is where uh, the thing will actually be happening if you have the meta XR plugin enabled. Okay, um, let me see if there's any other questions at the moment and then we'll pop over into our fun stuff over here. Oh, what's that little pop up? I've never seen that before. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Download Oculus Platform Utility. Um, interesting. That's about uploading directly from Unreal. Uh, cool. I'll explore that another time. Let me see if there's any questions. 
Ba, 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 ba. AR Foundation extensions made it easier, even though that repo is basically abandoned. Yeah, a lot of abandoned repos out there. Um, I get so excited when I see a GitHub that's like, oh, this is exactly what we need. And then it's like, has not been updated in seven years. <laughs> You're like, great, this worked with like the DK2. Fantastic. Uh, excellent. I know the workstation cards are unobtainable for most. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're hard to get, especially when you see companies uh, buying all of them <laughs> from NVIDIA directly. Makes it hard for, you know, a studio to get like one or two of them. Um, NVIDIA has been very nice to us. They've been a great partner. And even though we're a little tiny boutique studio, um, they've given us early access to a ton of stuff um, and given us free hardware too sometimes. So it, it is nice to feel supported um by a giant major corporate company like that um those are the mobile settings uh marshall i think the foveation settings i was just looking at i think those work in, here as well the eye tracking as far as i know still only works on mobile but general foveation does i believe work on on desktop as well i've definitely noticed foveation uh when i start to play with those settings okay so all I've done here, I've, I've been trying to say for a while, like anyone can download the sample for 5.3. It'll compile, it'll open up. It's got all this procedurally generated content. Amazing. Um, I'm in the biggest version of this, which if I zoom out, you see it's like this vast open world environment. Um, and what's interesting is you'll notice that, you know, my frame rate just here on desktop, it, like, it doesn't look that high. It's oscillating between like 30 and 70 FPS. Uh, so you must be thinking like, how is this possibly going to look okay in VR? Uh, we'll get to that. So let's go ahead and make this look like uh, Unreal again instead of Unity. And all you're going to need to do to just activate VR in general is you're going to go into here. And I, this has become my new advice. Like I made that video a while ago that's like, you know, how to get Lumen and Nanite and everything working in VR. And in that video, I basically say, like, start with a VR template and then change all these settings. Now it's at the point where I would say, do not start with a VR template. Start with literally any other template, because pretty much all of them are already set up for Lumen and Nanite. And then do this. You open up your content drawer, and then you do Add. And then you go and you say Add Feature or Content Pack. And then guess what? Right there, Blueprint, Virtual Reality. You can just add all the virtual reality stuff directly to your project. And what's quite nice about this is because of the enhanced input system, all that stuff comes along too. So like the spectator cam and the pistols and the way grabbing and all that works, they're just going to work out of the box. Before the enhanced input system, you'd have to deal with like messily going into that INI file for input and like combining what you had and what you have now. But like I could go ahead and I could add virtual reality and the vehicle uh, and a third person mode and they're all going to work pretty well side by side. So this is a great way to take any project uh, and just add virtual reality functionality to it. So I've already done that and I've made some modifications, so I don't want to do it again. Um, when you do that, it's going to say, hey, you need the OpenXR plugin enabled. So then, you know, you make sure that you go into plugins and enable OpenXR. You do need to do an engine restart at that point. And you can see some of the other plugins here about like eye tracking and hand tracking, Vive tracking for the Vive trackers, and there's that XR scribe plugin. Okay, so. Um, I think the only other thing I might have done in here is I might have gone into the post-process volumes and there might have been some like screen space effects like, yeah, dirt mask. Like I'd want to turn the dirt mask stuff off. Um, there's some like basic screen space stuff that not only does it not really look good in VR, but it also tends to um, slow things down. So, you know, I would turn down vignette to zero. I guess I haven't done this yet. Um, although it's disabled for some reason, I would go ahead and turn off lens flare. Um, so you'll notice that because these are grayed out, at this point, I'd basically say like, oh, uh, when I'm unchecking these, I'm not disabling them. I'm just disabling any kind of override. So if I actually want these things to be off, what I would then do is go into project settings and enable it at the project settings la level. So when I type in like lens flare, um, lens flares actually sometimes are starting to look good in VR. I was very impressed by Horizon Call of the Mountain uh, on PSVR 2. Uh, I thought the lens flares in there actually look really excellent. When possible, I do like to enable convolution bloom in VR. I think it looks gorgeous, uh, even though it is pretty expensive. Uh, what else? We want to turn off things like motion blur. Yeah, motion blur off. Let's make sure it's off in all of these as well. Off, off, off. So yeah, if I just uncheck these all, then it's going to go to the setting that we have um, over here, and everything should look better. Yeah, so usually when I open up a new project and I'm just adding VR to it, like this is one of those first things I do, um, I'll disable film grain, although film grain can also kind of look pretty cool in VR, FYI. And yeah, anything that's like a screen space effect, um, besides something like, you know, bloom, you're going to want to disable if you want a clean, performant 
scene film grain. I don't know if that's even something in the project settings. That's okay. Okay. Uh, let me just hit play. Let me just hit play. Maybe it'll crash. Maybe it'll work. Um, is this live stream going to be available? Yes. Um, again, I am a Luddite when it comes to things like live streaming, but I believe that I did hit the check boxes for like make the live stream immediately available afterwards and like keep the chat. Cause I've done a couple live streams where I was like, Hey, the chat's gone. There's a little toggle where you actually need to say like preserve the chat. And so some of those videos look ridiculous now because I'm just talking to a chat stream that no one can see. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and try hitting play. It might crash. It might crash. We'll find out. Oh, and of course, the other thing, too, is I did, of course, go into project settings and enable instant stereo. That's going to be a key part of this as well. Um, and then I mentioned I've got DLSS running in here. Do, 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 do. And obviously, of course, anything in the Unreal Engine editor um, is heavier to run than if you do an actual packaged build. There we go. OK, but I'm in here. It's a little bit loud. Let me turn down the uh, desktop audio a bit. OK, so we still have the drone controls here. It's still just showing all the stuff from before. Um, but I'm in VR, and this looks really, really good. That's kind of the, the big the big takeaway. And if I grab my controllers, I can see I've got my stuff going on there. Um, and the first thing I'll do is just kind of look around and say, like, wow, look at the lumen effects, um, look at the frame rate. And you know, if I actually do stat FPS, you'll see that I'm only hitting like 25 frames per second, but reprojection is doubling that. So it feels like 50 and it's actually okay. Like this is actually very manageable. And this is one of the reasons why I have found myself using more uh, meta products lately than something like Vive because all the little behind the scenes stuff that smooths out this experience is uh, really doing a lot to make a, a non-performance scene work better. Uh, KO, no, DLSS is not available for 5.3, but we did manage to get it upgraded thanks to Battle Axe VR. So I'm using DLSS uh, 3.5 in here with 5.3. Oh, that's so confusing. 3.5, 5.3. Little uh, palindrome? Is palindrome the word? Yes. Anyways, that is definitely helping a little bit here as well. You'll see that there are some different DLSS settings I could start to mess with. Um, I can just confirm that it's enabled, but I'm, I think I'm using the ultra performance mode. Um, anyways, let's just take a look at a couple of the videos because there's some cool little videos here. So if I do shift, shift C, shift V, shift B, I'm just going to kind of go on a little bit of a roller coaster ride and it feels really good. Flying through the sky. Nice music. Feels totally epic. I can look around wherever I want. And this is just running remarkably well, considering there are just billions of triangles passing me by. <laughs> Go through the cave. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is I, I don't think I've noticed this before, and this might have something to do with live streaming, but the audio is stuttering more for me than um, anything visual. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and then it brings me back here. Uh, by the way, let me try enabling R dot, ooh, what is it, nanite. I have like some shortcuts for this stuff elsewhere, but if I do R dot nanite visualize uh, triangles, check this out. Yeah, look at all those triangles. Crazy, right? <laughs> Although now that's locking everything up. I just want to give a sense of just how much geometry is actually here. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not getting any motion sickness from this. I apologize. Normally, when I'm doing like a, a stream like this, I would be using a spectator cam to smooth everything out. But um, yeah, it's amazing how well this looks. Okay, it actually did smooth out. So let me go ahead and do that same animation again. And now, <laughs> I mean, all you're, all you're going to be able to tell is like, yeah, billions and billions of triangles, this like pixel level LOD thing that Nanite does. And uh, it's just pretty amazing that this is even possible now. Because for a while, I was getting nervous that like, I don't know, maybe we're not going to be able to get Lumen and Nanite to really be performant in VR. And it's come a long way. And 5.3 is a, a meaningful upgrade to all of that. So cool. Um, yeah. And it's just going to end in a second. There's the opal material over there. You can see that one's not using Nanite. And then let me turn um, Nanite off. And we'll just go through a couple more of these videos because... They look great. Oh, what's the command I need to have to turn this off? Visualize none. There we go. Great. OK, so then we've got uh, Shift V. Here's another little video. Oh, and I'll also show you um, what you need to do to disable um, like the camera moving without your permission. So you can actually go into the sequences and make it a little bit more palatable 
for VR, but man, like this just feels so good. And like, I just really have a sense of like, there's a huge forest here and I could kind of just hang out and like meditate here, which is pretty remarkable. It just looks great. Oh, and this one maybe doesn't end. It maybe just stays up here for a while, but I can just enjoy the view and uh, it just feels really good. Like, yeah, no motion sickness at all for me. And then I think the last one was uh, Shift B. Was it Shift B? All right, where are we going now? We're going on an adventure. A little bit of stuttering on those trees there. But like the fact that I can look off into the distance and see like these trees up at the top of the mountain and like, yeah, I can tell they're trees and this is all running pretty smoothly is great. You know, and I do have a little bit of a sense of um, the pixel density changing a little bit. You know, I could make this. Um, oh, actually, you know, what? and I don't even have the Meta XR plug in here. So maybe it's not doing dynamic pixel density changing. Yeah, the Meta XR plug isn't out for 5.3 yet. So um, I would have to do that manually. So I could, for example, and you might even see a difference here on screen if I do VR.pixel density and bring it up to like 1.5. Yeah, so everything gets a lot sharper. And now like I can see even more like the trees on the rocky outcrop way in the back and they look really good. And actually I thought that was really gonna hurt my performance. It's not bad, especially if I don't move my head too much. If I swing my head to the side, I definitely see some streaking. Um, Shout out, make a streak, man. But then if I just uh, hold my head pretty still or just do kind of like light movements, you know, that still feels really great. Um, let me try going up into something crazy. Like uh, I might crash it, but let's try pixel density 1.8. Oh, man, <laughs> that looks really good. Uh, that looks really good. OK, we're going to test fate and just keep cranking it up. Pixel density 2. Even better. All right, now I'm starting to feel a little bit more stuttering. Yeah. And I wonder what the frame rate says I'm getting. It says I'm getting like 20. So yeah, so that's doubling with reprojection to something closer to like 40. Um, yeah, that's not going to be an ideal VR experience. But, you know, it feels like it's one of those things. Like, what are you trading off? Comfort for incredible sharpness and clarity. And um, just the ability for me to see things very close by and very far away and have them all look amazing. Um, for me, I can, I can stomach a little bit of discomfort for the quality of that, but certainly for most people, if I was going to bring this to like a, a trade show or something like that, I would, I'd probably be running this at a, maybe VR pixel density 1.2, I think would be where I'd feel like things are, are the best balance between looking good and being comfortable for the kind of movement people might have. If they're like, I want to look behind me and see what's over here. So yeah, so this is a pretty simple thing that you can go ahead and uh, do on your own just by downloading the Electric Dream sample. Um, yeah, I'll show the, <laughs> the TLS settings are so simple, Kent. I wish I could say like there's some really complex uh, DLS stuff I'm doing. Uh, I think at, in the level blueprint, I believe I'm literally just enabling um, ultra performance. That's it, <laughs> just DLSS mode, ultra performance, and that is it. Um, and for a while, I thought that you needed to also use this DLSS enable mode. Um, but it seems like this doesn't really matter. I actually have no idea what this actually does because on or off, it doesn't seem to make a difference. I think this is literally the only mode. You can also make DLSS go auto, um, you know, and there's other settings here for like quality and balance. I'm just trying to crank out as much performance as I can. And so that's all I've been playing with there. Then these are all the specific things to the actual map. Um, Try and remember why I brought down the reflection quality. Oh, I think that was because of the weird stuff happening um, on the opal material. Let me try bringing it down to one. Um, yeah, let me get over to that opal material real quick. Uh, so if instead of default player start location, I do current camera location, then yeah, there was one weird thing happening with that opal material, which I've definitely seen looking really good in VR before. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Da, 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 da. There it is. I found it. So it's looking fine now. You know, we've got all this incredible like depth to this material. We've got reflections on it, um, but it was doing some weird reflectivity things. Um, yes, that's right, Kent. It was compiled for 5.3 uh, by Battle Axe VR. I think maybe we can find a way to like share it on a case by case basis. I just don't want to break any kind of NVIDIA EULA stuff. Um, so feel free to talk to us about that offline <laughs> and maybe we can figure something out. OK, let me try hitting play here. Da, 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 da. 
see if we're getting any anything wacky with the opal material or if it's going to work. <laughs> Battle Axe VR, that's right. Yes, you can find them on Twitter. Um, oh, the stream bit rate's low. I'm sorry to hear that. It's uh, it's feeling good good for me. Um, okay, okay, yeah, the opal material looks good right now. Um, yeah, so I mean, not a lot for for you to see from your angle, but like, it looks good in stereo. Like, I have a sense that there's like depth in here, and uh, it's just a very lovely looking material. That's that's kind of all I can say. Um, ooh, although ooh, something weird's happening now. It's like blooming. Um, wow, this is like a weird science experiment. It's only happening in my right eye. Oh yeah, here, let me show you exactly what I'm seeing. So I do VR spectator screen mode two. Check out what's going on in my right eye. It was looking totally fine at first. And now we've got this like strange, like it's like a virus taking over there. That's really weird. Um, okay, let's do a quick experiment and see if we can troubleshoot that. Let me try um, R dot or SG dot reflection quality. Let me try zero. Okay, so that turn that that solves that completely. And actually, you know what? It looks better with reflection quality at zero, although of course then I don't think we have any lumen reflections on. But I do get more of a sense of the depth of what's actually happening in here with reflections off. Um, let me try doing the other direction. What if I do reflection quality like four? Nope, it freaks out again. Okay, so it's a reflection problem. Good to know. But yeah, this still looks really cool. Just the way that just like an actual opal, I can kind of like turn my head and look around and it just feels like there's incredible depth to this big translucent gem of an object. Um, cool. Although, wow, I really ruined the rest of the scene by turning off reflection. It looks fine over there. Over here, it looks like I'm about to step into some kind of nightmare. Weird. Uh, cool. That's great. That's fun. Um, I did mention I was going to talk about the sequence real quick. So if you have a sequence like the Meerkat demo, which you'll see in a moment, uh, that you want to try to get to work well with VR, then what you want to do is you want to open up the sequence and you're going to want to disable any kind of cinematic um, shot camera. Oh, and I'm sorry, there's, there's two different approaches here. So one is like, do you want the camera to take you on a ride? Do you want to actually fly around with it? In that case, yes, you do want the camera cuts. Um, but then what you might want to do is within that, that camera, the camera actor here, for example, you might want to go and um, make sure that you are not keying something like rotation because rotation is going to start to ugh, like rotate you against your will. And that can be kind of bleh and not feel great. So what I would do probably in this case is like I would delete rotation and scale. So it's literally just moving the camera and I can go on a little bit of that roller coaster ride, but I have full control over what I can see. If instead you've got something like um, I was playing the, the, the Meerkat demo is a great example or like the Slay animation sample. If you're like, I don't want to have the cinematic version of this experience. I want it to be more like theater and I want to just hang out and watch this performance like I'm right there with the Meerkat and the, the Eagle. In that case, what you do is you go up into the top level of the sequence and you just delete the camera cut or mute it if you think you're going to have it on later. And now what's going to happen is whatever animation is happening, in this case, it's just a camera, the animation will still play out. Out, but it's not going to try to take over your player camera at all. So that's really handy. Um, yes, I agree. Uh, if you need to get your settings in a better place, start by just turning down the pixel density and you will uh, that's a good place to start. In, in a lot of the demos I'm releasing now, I try to even start the quality settings down lower and usually I'll just have like a button like the, uh, the zero button or like a joystick that you can click to kind of cycle up the quality settings. Uh, Marshall's been working on a really cool thing that should be ready today uh, on how we will auto detect your hardware configuration. And it'll be like a one second kind of like benchmark test. We'll probably just put you in blackness for that. And then it should give you kind of like optimal settings for whatever your particular hardware is uh, for kind of getting things to look the best that they possibly can. But it's kind of like a one click solution. So you wouldn't be necessarily dialing up and down, you know, reflections versus something else. It would be kind of like we want you to hit 45, 45 frames per second so it can reproject to 90. Uh, and therefore, you know, we're doing this thing. By the way, before I forget, I want to mention that uh, before 5.3, there was a bit of a bug when using Steam VR with Lumen and Nanite, and it would crash unless you used a launch parameter called no RHI thread. Um, I have now tested, and that is no longer a problem in 5.3, which is great. So Steam VR now works in here, uh, especially if you want to mess with things like changing the pixel density. That's another thing that would make Steam VR crash um, if you didn't have the pixel density set to exactly one. So just want to point out that that is happening better now. Uh, let me go through some of these questions real quick. Da, 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 da. Yes, I need to learn the new material system too. I have like no idea what kind of 
black magic is happening inside of here. <laughs> like, what the heck is a substrate vertical layer with three BSDF things? <laughs> like, yeah, this is all completely Greek to me, and I'm Greek. Ha ha. So let's see what some of the other questions are, and then we'll move on to things like the Meerkat demo, and I can show you like grooms working in VR. Um, and yes, I did want to mention, of course, that before you start playing in something like the Electric Dream sample, make sure you go and for VR, you have start in VR if you're going to build it out. Um, oh, that's interesting. I have foveation off. I mean, that would definitely be helping. Um, instant stereo on, and then I think that's really it. Screen percentage mode for VR, manual or based on display resolution. Those are new features that I haven't tested that much yet, but um, usually I am manually setting the screen percentage. So I'm not even quite sure, like based on display resolution, based on operating systems, DPI scale. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious if someone does a bit of a deep dive into those three different settings and uh, how they all work differently. Um, but yes, definitely instant stereo. That's the big magic thing of 5.3. That's gonna almost double your performance for anything with Lumen and Nanite. And I might have added in an action mapping for reset VR. What else? What else? What else? Yeah, and here's all the uh, the DLSS plugins, by the way. Oh, we only have super resolution in here. Ah, interesting. We actually so this one is actually using just in uh, DLSS three. We do have three point five with the um, the streamline plugin and the NIS plugin as well. So this actually could be running even more performant than it is right now. Uh, there's also this magical DLSS G mode that I still need to play with more that came in 5.3. Uh, so yeah, 3.5, 5.3, that's gonna drive me crazy. So that's that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions and then we will keep moving on. Thanks everyone for staying so engaged. I can already tell this is gonna be a, a live, a long live stream and I'm having fun. If you're having fun, great. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. You said do desktop VR, standalone VR, keep performance in mind. Yes, yeah, start with the VR template. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing all these projects nowadays that where we are targeting like very high end hardware. It's a very different ball game if you are targeting lower end hardware. Um, although I do want to point out something cool about Nanite is if you have a Nanite scene and then you try to build it to uh, mobile, of course, Nanite is not supported on mobile, but it will automatically do kind of like the lowest poly version of that Nanite model, basically like a super uh, optimized LOD, generally looks pretty good. And that's what it will put on your mobile platform. So I did a little test with like, you know, a billion polygons in the scene. Uh, this statue instanced a bunch of times, literally changed nothing, just made an APK of it, put it on the quest, and it actually ran really well because of the fact that it automatically brought down the poly count uh, to something much smaller. I have a video of that somewhere on my channel. Uh, maybe I'll post that when I have a second. Uh, actually, right now, real quick, because it's a useful thing. I think a lot of people don't realize that just because you have Nanite active doesn't mean that you like can't do anything now um, in mobile. Da -da 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 -da. Before all my MetaHuman animator stuff, Nanite, 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 Nanite. Man, I've been making more videos than I thought. <laughs> I have to scroll down a lot further than I expected. Uh, I just clicked on the wrong one. There it is. Okay. This was back in 5.3. Cool. There's that. Uh, more questions, more questions. And actually, you know, while we're doing questions, let me go ahead and open up our next project. Hopefully there wasn't anything else anyone wanted to ask about that one. Uh, but I do want to do the, this guy, this guy, this guy, my awesome VR 5.3 one. And there's a build in there too. We'll run if things look a little bit laggy. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, everything I'm showing in editor is going to look even better um, when it's actually built and optimized and editor content excluded and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that bug killed me now says <laughs> over a hundred crashes because of that in DX12. Yeah, the Steam VR thing was rough. Uh, Substrate is an awesome shift to flexibility. The open material is beautiful. I agree. Uh, lots of improvements, sure. Oh, that's interesting. Kayo says it looked like the texture was glitching when the GPU is out of VRAM. Um, interesting. Yeah, that could absolutely be it. It's so fascinating with the Opal, how it almost seemed like it got stuck in this like death spiral of like getting worse and worse and worse. I'd, I'm going to talk to some folks at Epic about that. And I'm curious if there's a, a simple fix for that or if that's going to be further in the future. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Lots of good comments, guys. Uh, smart people in here. Application Space Warp was an optimization with the in the Oculus fork of UE. Uh, it's no longer relevant nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's great to just use the MetaXR plugin and not have to actually use the MetaXR fork of Unreal, especially because it's usually lagging behind. 
Um, NVIDIA has a really cool fork of Unreal, also that lags behind a little bit, but RTX DI, I have another video about that. I'm not gonna go find it right now, but RTX DI looks incredible in VR. You can have thousands of lights casting ray trace shadows. Uh, there's like a carnival scene that NVIDIA's let me play with and it looks incredible, really, really good. Uh, fallback LODs. Yes, that's right. I use fallback LODs regardless of action and time for mobile. This is my first time on your channel. The algorithm. Oh, thank you. I'm glad the algorithm chose me today. Hi, Skrieg. Welcome. Um, I am not a, a, a YouTuber by trade and I post very irregularly, but I try to be helpful to the community when I can. Uh, no, Kayo, just to be clear, Nanite is not working for mobile. Nanite does like a thing where it falls back to a proxy mesh when a Nanite mesh is going to mobile. I, I got in a little bit of trouble for almost saying Nanite is supported by uh, mobile. That's not quite the case. Uh, okay, so let's look at some stuff over in this project. So the way this project is set up, if I go over into, and that's not the project, I'll walk you through a little bit of what's going on in here right now. So I'll start with our main level. Is this the right one? I honestly can't remember anymore. No, it should be the PCG one. It should be the PCG one. This one is the Meerkat demo, the original one. Um, what I've basically done here for this kind of showcase of 5.3, uh, which again, anyone can download the Dropboxes in like my previous video, and I'm gonna keep updating this as well, is I just mashed together a bunch of different stuff from Unreal Engine sample projects, as well as um, things that Agile Lens has been working on just to kind of give you a bit of a tour of all sorts of cool stuff happening um, inside of Unreal. So recently, um, Marshall and I started to play with getting basically the version of tilt brush controls to work in Unreal. And that is a really cool way to experience um, Lumen and Nanite, particularly because of the way you can see the shadows and the scale and all the detail of things to uh, adjust. Yes, now I'm definitely going to use the spectator cam to make this a less uh, nauseating experience for you. And so this is this is just the like little map because I'm trying to output this for everyone to kind of take a look at. This is one of those maps where people have told me that this is running on uh, GTX 1080, which is great. And it looks really good in VR. The spectator cam, super quick flyby of a couple quick optimizations I've made to this. Uh, one is that if you want to open your project and just use the spectator cam and not even use VR, if you make the scene capture component 2D the parent, uh, instead of whatever was there before, like an empty root actor, that's going to allow you to use the mouse and fly around and do all the things you want to, uh, looking up and down. So that's kind of a cool little feature. Um, I've talked about this in previous talks. Just uh, I've mapped the M key to make sure that we're getting this dampened view of the first person character. So you'll see that in a moment. Um, and then this is a fun one. Um, so a lot of times the problem with showing the VR spectator camera is you're not actually showing what someone sees in VR. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes I'll do something fun, like, oh boy, my camera's starting to glitch. I wonder if my phone's overheating. Um, sometimes I'll do something fun where I will intentionally make the VR experience really, really bad, and I will put all the rendering resources over into the spectator camera because I know that I'm just basically driving an experience that other people are going to be watching. That's great for like if I'm at a big architecture firm and trying to show like, here's what the building's going to look like. Um, so then it's like I'm looking at some PS2 era graphics, but they see something amazing on the uh, dampened spectator camera. However, if you want to actually make sure that the spectator camera is matching the same settings that you have in here, including things like Lumen and Nanite being enabled, here's a really simple thing you can do. At begin playing the spectator camera, I'm just looking for a post-process volume. Comes a bit of a problem if there's more than one, but as long as you only have one, um, it is literally just going to match those settings. It's just going to say, let's make the spectator camera match the same settings as the post-process volume, where if it's unbounded, that's also what the VR player is going to see. Uh, one other thing I've done in here is I made it so that the field of view also works. Um, boy, I cannot remember how I did it, though. I, might, I mean, this will this will end up in our GitHub. So yeah, the, I, the field of view wasn't working if you weren't in um, full VR mode. Um, anyway, this will be something that we'll release to the public in GitHub. But it's like a nice little enhanced version of the spectator camera. Um, and then, yeah, let's just hit play and I'll show you a little bit more of what's going on in this whole setup that I've got. So I launch into this um, at some fairly low settings. And of course, I can crank these up because of my hardware. So until I get Marshall's little thing into here, I can press, you know, the zero key and start to crank up medium quality, high quality, epic quality, and things get sharper and sharper and sharper. Um, I can do number keys on my keyboard to crank up and down things like pixel density. Um, so I think I can go like 0.8 to point, um, two or 1.2 or something like that. And so this is super, super sharp in here right now. Super, super sharp. 
And if I wanted to play with like screen percentage, that would be another way of going about that, but affecting uh, more of what's on that screen versus here. Um, let me go over to the spectator camera. Let's stop shaking around. So here's the spectator camera. Oh, I also added a little feature where if you press the R key while navigating the spectator camera, it should recenter on the, the VR player. So you see me with my little headset there. Um, and then, so right now I'm just in like my fly mode. So I'm just flying around with the spectator camera. But if I want to give you guys a not nauseating view of what I'm actually doing in VR, so I've mapped the M key. So now it's going to like kind of blend over and it's now going to match my view. And as I move my head around, you will get a much less nauseating view of exactly what I'm looking at. Right? So that's pretty cool. Um, let me also just turn down the pixel density a little bit to smooth this out. Great. Okay, things are looking good. And this is going to be a little bit hard for you to see. Actually, if I let me go actually back out of the spectator camera view over here um, and look at me. So watch this. So Tilt Brush. Anyone who's played Tilt Brush, raise your hand. What I love about Tilt Brush is the way that you navigate the world. So instead of your standard like locomotion and all that of teleportation, um, you actually do things like you grab the world and rotate around. And you can scale up and scale down. So a little hard to tell, but I'm getting like tiny, 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 and bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, oh, the headset isn't scaling. I'll need to fix that. But this is a really cool way to navigate the world. I can grab the world as kind of like a fixed anchor point and move around this way. And I can get like, you know, very, very, very tiny if I want to and like zoom in and look at the ground and say like, look at these rocks. They're so beautiful and really appreciate the detail that Nanite offers. And uh, then, yeah, we'll go back to the first person view mode so you can see that also we've, uh, oh, I'm, I'm missing the text, but we also have some text in here that um, if I activated it correctly would actually show you the exact scale you're at at any given moment. So yeah, this is like the, the fun way to do things uh, via tilt brush. Uh, that, that sun coming through there looks beautiful. Oh, one thing I wanted to add really quick specifically for that is exponential height fog. This is another thing that looks really good. Um, oops, here's the mistake I probably made in my VR pawn related to scale texture render. Oh yeah, Marshall might have an idea on this. Uh, scale texture render, it's not finding that. Do I need to set that somewhere? Uh, hmm, 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 interesting. Yeah, I just copied this over last night from um, our previous version. Uh, where do you get set? Don't worry about it. <laughs> scale UI. Um, this is also for the menu. That's our little debug line. Anyways, uh, what I was going to say was exponential height fog now does some really cool things inside 5.3 in VR. So let's drag or just make sure that it's actually volumetric. I don't think it is right now. So I just scroll down in my exponential height fog and oh, it is volumetric, but maybe I just want to make it like a little bit thicker. So that I'll be able to appreciate a little bit more of like the sun coming through. So I'm changing the extinction scale there. I'll make the fog density a little bit higher here. And this is going to look really nice in VR. Cool. OK, back to VR. Back to our dampened spectator camera. Um, let's crank up the quality a little bit. Medium quality, high quality. Um, over here, free cam, matching player cam. Oh, there we go. I got to go over to the actual uh, spectator camera. There we go. Great. So yeah, nice cloudy day. Uh, things look really, really good. I'm dragging the world toward me. I'm getting bigger and smaller. And let's see how I do way up here. I've also set some artificial limits on how big and how small you can be. But this looks really nice. Oh yeah, and I can actually <laughs> see the spectator camera following me. Um, although you can't see it. Hold on, if I, if I do this real quick. There's the spectator camera <laughs> as it tries to catch up with me. Uh, cool. OK, so that's scene one. Um, what else do I have in here? Oh, yeah, I've got uh, the ability to change the sun. So with the joystick here, I can rotate the sun and just really enjoy changing you know, how the light is casting everywhere, although it's a little bit harder to see with all the exponential height fog um, in the way. But this is cool. So watch this. If I uh, spawn a little blaster in front of me, if I hold this with my right hand, I can start to make some random glowing balls just to really showcase the power of Lumen, they're all random colors. And then if I start to, you know, put us in more of like a nighttime scenario, nighttime, see the sunset, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Bring it back up for a sec. Um, then I can really start to enjoy, although the fog actually keeps things a little bit brighter. I've got like a little flashlight here as well, so I can start to like navigate along the ground. 
yeah, the fog is keeping things a little bit brighter than normal, but that's cool. And then if I grab this with my left hand, this will make some little chrome balls. And this lets me appreciate uh, the real-time reflections. Every one of these chrome balls, I'm just gonna make a bunch of them for a second. And we've got, you know, collisions happening here. Um, I'm gonna try to zoom in close to one of these chrome balls and you'll see that, you know, everything is being reflected. It's so crazy. We've got the reflection of the glowing things and the reflections of the environment and the reflections of my headset. Hello, hello. And it's just a very cool uh, world that we're in now. Uh, flashlight in the dark cave. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be a huge cool thing. All right, let's go to the next map uh, because things will look actually a little bit better when we get into the dark. Um, so to get to the next map, I can click, uh, what is it, the joystick on my controller, left joystick, or the space bar on the keyboard. And this will load up the Meerkat demo. Fun. Ready? Oh, the Meerkat demo needs the spectator cam. Yeah, there it is. I'm gonna have to do like an auto match of this. Okay, where's my Meerkat? Where are you, dude? He's over here, he's over here. And I can see fur in both eyes, it's amazing. <laughs> and I can get this and do some glowy balls. But let's just let's just enjoy the meerkat for a second. Okay, so we got our eagle up in the sky. Um, I did have to play with like smoothing out some of the animation since it was done for these cinematic shots. All right, where is he? There he is. So let's get in here with him. Let's experience this. Here he comes, here he comes. Ah! <laughs> and then the eagle has that on his face, <laughs> falls down, collapses. The sound design is great too. Everything sounds really good. Let's spawn this. Oh, and by the way, I can grab this and like scale it up or scale it down. Woo, bye eagle. Watch all these bounce, and then let's go to uh, a little bit more nighttime as this repeats. A little bit more nighttime. Oh, I know why it still looks so um, uh, light. I didn't crank up the uh, the quality settings. Let's do that real quick. <laughs> oh, and I crashed it. Ah, oh, man. Okay, send and restart. <laughs> so this is why the like auto detect quality will be helpful to uh, to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. Um, I do find Unreal Engine gets stable unstable if you start to adjust different quality settings too much. Um, yeah, the particles when the eagle fell is cool. Don't shoot it. Yeah, I didn't want to shoot the eagle or anything. I just, I'm just trying to populate the scene with, with glowing magical things and all that. Uh, so let's go back over to that meerkat map. Yeah. Hey, Carlos. Carlos is here too. What's up, Carlos? Uh, yeah, Yui really is magic. I, I want you all to experience what this feels like in VR, because of course the 2D version can only go so far. Um, but let me show you really quickly how I got grooms to work on both of these because I don't even know if this is like officially a 5.3 thing, but this did, did not work for me in 5.3 before and it does work for me now. So what I'm doing is I'm doing reflection quality one and global illumination quality one. And then even if I crank up from there, um, I do find that the grooms stay. But if I start at settings different from that, um, then I do not see the grooms in both eyes. Also, I do my texture streaming pool at zero, which sets it to whatever number it needs to be and then we're in a good place. Uh, okay, so let's try that again one more time. Uh, play. All right, and I'm gonna try bringing the sun down. Whoops, why can't I see what I'm doing? There we are. All right, rotating around. Hey, meerkat, oh my God. So here I am at like a super tiny scale and I can see like every fur on his body. Um, I think I also made a pause button. I did make a pause button, great. So at any given moment, if I want to just pause the scene and like zoom in really close and just appreciate all the detail on this little guy, I can. So I'm gonna make myself tiny, tiny, tiny and just go like, wow, look at all these whiskers, look at the nose, look at the eye. Um, I feel like I'm the size of his, you know, eyeball right now. And it feels amazing. Just, I'm literally just doing this, just kind of like rotating around, seeing the lumen light bouncing off of him, seeing all the hair strands. Um, oh, and I'm not even giving you like the spectator mode, but it looks so, so good. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, and then I resume. Um, let's change the time of day a little bit. Let's make it a little bit darker. Look at that sky, beautiful. And let's go back to the spectator mode so you don't get sick. 
Oh, where is it? Oh, it's black for some reason. Um, it's right there. That's strange. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, what did I want to do? Yeah, I just want to make it a little bit darker so we can see a little bit more of our glowy balls here. So I'm making the, the weapon enormous just because of the way the scene is designed for this very high velocity. Uh, up into the air, up into the air. And once these all land, yeah. Oh, and those are the, oh, the flashlight. Let's look at the flashlight too, because that's a cool way to. Oops. Okay, I gotta score. Scale it down. Move around. Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't not hold it right now. That's weird. Scale it down more. There we go. All right, let me try restarting the scene. Uh, by the way, great little C bar, restart level. Something weird was happening. So, okay, all I wanted to do really was let's go where I'm super big, ignoring the VR spectator camera for a second. Hey, little meerkat. Um, I'm going to, it'd be fun if I could like pick up the egg or something. So I want to get this out and I just want to have a few of these big glowy balls in the scene. And I'll do some chrome ones. So just populating the scene, and then I'm going to just bring it down to nighttime. There we go. So now we can just enjoy, like, Lumen actively, like, starting to make the environment uh, glow and all that, and all the reflections we get. That's pretty fun. Okay, anyways, <laughs> next level. And I haven't looked at the chat in a bit. Let's see what we got for... Oh, yeah, I wanted to show the flashlight again. That's okay. Uh, officially converted to UE. Oh, I converted someone to UE. Not my goal. I'm just trying to let you guys know what's going on here. Um, hey, go hang out with your girl. Cool, Kent. Bye, Kent. Um, emissive materials are always fun. Fog really helps bring it to life. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Okay, so this is fun. This is a, this is a crazy thing that I was a little nervous about including, but this came with the Project Hillside sample project. And this is a, a little sequence animation they have at the beginning where they show this building in Montreal, like, coming together in this really cool animation. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to fly through this with all the crazy Lumen settings and everything happening in it. And you just see like all these pieces of architecture flying around. That was an umbrella that just flew past me. Um, let me crank up the quality a little bit. And it's just a really, really cool looking scene. We've got like flower petals everywhere. They're blooming. We've got all this foliage being constructed around us. I should add some music to this because I don't think there's any music but it feels really cool. should restart in a second and maybe it'll uh, be a little bit less confused about what's going on. This, and this does run well in the packaged version. So we're going through all this, yeah. And by the way, uh, so what I did in order to make this work in the sequence was um, I actually just made the VR pawn a child of the camera. So I'm actually not using the camera at all. The camera's just moving. Um, and then I am just under that, and that allowed me to adjust for things like what my height's going to be. But because I'm not actually the thing that is being piloted directly as this moves around, I can do things like start to, um, you know, move around. I can pause the scene, of course. Uh, whoops, did I press the wrong button? <laughs> I was going to say I can pause the sequence. Can I not pause the sequence? I thought I could pause the sequence. But there's all sorts of things that I still have the ability to do, like changing the scale, uh, and whatnot because of the fact that I am not directly being controlled by the animation. Um, I am a child of the animation. So I can see all sorts of stuff moving around. Um, as long as we have this open as well, let me open up that real quick because I want to show you the one thing that's really frustrating me right now um, about 5.3 because we're so close to this being exciting. And yeah, the scene is like Inception. That's right now. Uh, I'm using a MetaQuest Pro, by the way. Yes, flashlight, flashlight. I will show the flashlight again. Um, let me just open up that scene really quick because I'm, well, let's do, we're already in the meerkat scene. Let me do a quick flashlight here. Dipper, dipper, do. Let's make it nighttime. I don't know why it's not making that my front view. Um, ba, 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 ba. Oh, there's also a nice bug that's been fixed where you used to not be able to scale if anything in your editor was open. Now it still works. Um, okay, flashlight. Flashlight here, and you can't see it because it's too bright out, so let's make it nighttime. Nighttime, nighttime, nighttime. And. There's our flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I can 
go over to that spectator camera. So weird the spectator camera's black there. There's some setting that I think isn't coming over when I start here instead of starting somewhere else, but core flashlight. Yeah, and the quality settings look different now too. Let me try uh, bringing that up. Yeah, there's something something strange about uh, going right into the meerkat level instead of um, starting in the original sequence. I think there's some settings that I do at the beginning uh, where we're still in the Electric Dreams demo that are supposed to carry through into the meerkat demo. But okay, I'll show the flashlight and then uh, I wanna show the, the only thing that's like really frustrating me about 5.3 in terms of new updates. And the easiest place to do that is in that teaser. So this is where the whole sequence is for the hillside sample with uh, Habitat 67. Really cool project by uh, Carlos Cristerna and Neoscape and Epic Games and all the cool people there. But let's, uh, let's go zoom out a little bit so we see all the content in here. Um, just for the sake of seeing what's happening here a little bit better, I'm going to change my exposure settings to something a little bit more palatable for the game. Check out that volumetric light. That looks really good in VR now. And yes, the whole world is sideways, which makes it very hard to navigate properly. Um, but if we find something that has a reflective surface, there's the Montreal Ferris wheel. Um, there's something over here where we have windows, right? Okay, so here's some windows. Uh, oh, and actually, these are these are not real environments. That's a oh, it is a real environment. <laughs> I was gonna say it's a cube map, but uh, that is actually real. We're gonna do a quick little test here where I show you um, that if we go and we find like a chrome material, like a nice mirror material, like this one, and I drop that here, cool, right? We've got some high quality reflections, uh, fairly high quality, and I'll drop it also here. And this is okay. Uh, what if we want it to be like a perfect mirror reflection? Uh, tint color, da, 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 da. Ooh, too many settings there. Metallic amount, roughness amount zero. So we're trying to do a, a perfect mirror reflection, okay? Okay, so it's not quite perfect and you can see some of the lumen artifacts happening in the background. Um, so that's not perfectly ideal. And then the other problem is that if I am in, oof, I don't know where my post-process volume is here. Is there not one? That'd be crazy. Is there no post-process volume? It's creepy. If I try to enable high quality translucency reflections, things are gonna get a little bit wonky. Um, it was built on a vertical monitor. That's hilarious. I'm gonna tell Carlos he said that. Um, so we got some weird screen space reflection stuff happening here, but if we go ahead and we just add a post-process volume and we set it to infinite extents unbound and we do Lumen. First thing I always do to make sure that a post-process volume is actually doing something is I usually go to something like uh, the temperature and I crank that up and down. So I was like, okay, great. So I can see that it's it's clearly doing a thing. So let's enable uh, or let's start to set up some of our Lumen things in reflections as well as uh, in GI. So Lumen GI, Lumen reflections. So uh, there's this wonderful little checkbox for the reflections for high quality translucency reflections, right? So this is how you actually start to get things to look more like mirror reflections, especially if you have um, ray tracing enabled. Use hardware ray tracing when available, yes. Um, and so I've got lumen quality. I, I don't actually see a huge difference when I toggle this up and down, especially in VR. Ray lighting mode, we want this to be not surface cache, we want it to be hit lighting. Hit lighting is better quality. Anyway, so we're getting pretty good mirror reflections here. Still some GI artifacts, but here's the thing that drives me crazy. High quality, oh, and tr sorry, translucency reflections has to do with glass. So if we've got something, ugh, there should be like a, a window or something over here that's actually glass. Uh, here we go. So the, the reflections we're getting off of here, a little bit hard to see that are for the glass. Those only work in one eye in VR. That's the thing that's driving me crazy, just to cut to the chase, is if you want good quality glass reflections in VR, Right now, you kind of still have to use ray tracing, and ray tracing is very expensive in VR. We still have projects like the Four Seasons one that are in 4.27 because of the fact that uh, Lumen and Nanite, Lumen in particular, just can't quite get to a high enough reflection quality level um, in VR. Uh, although I love things like you know max reflection bounces now in in VR, like that looks great. Being able to have two mirrors that are uh, facing each other, totally lost where my my other little thing was. Oh, here it is. Um, so if I've got, you know, this reflective surface and this reflective surface, and then I make this a reflective surface. So if I start to crank 
this up and down. Oh, not seeing it, but it should. It should. Those bounces should be happening off of each other. Uh, let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Lumen quality. I guess you see it over here. Um, one, two. I guess we just don't have uh, enough things reflecting off of themselves. But if you just have like a double mirror scene here, I'm just going to make everything reflective. That's reflective, and that's reflective, and that's reflective. Two things facing each other. What about way down here? So, huh, yeah, I don't feel, I mean, we're definitely seeing something, but the whole point is supposed to be like every one of those reflection bounces allows like two mirrors facing each other to have uh, more and more depth. Hit lighting versus surface cache. Yeah, hit lighting looks better. Um, let me try cranking up things like final gather quality or scene lighting quality. These are things that, again, like I don't see that much of a difference in VR when I change these. Like I really want that Lumen GI noise to go away. And, I, and as far as I can tell, it's basically impossible. Like for the moment, Lumen still does not really intend to work well for mirror reflections. But then, you know, as soon as I crank the roughness up just a little bit, if I make the roughness even 0.2, suddenly like cool, like it's totally sellable. Um, so anyway, that's my big complaint um, <laughs> about, about high quality translucency reflections only working in one eye in VR. Um, although credit where credit's due, another cool new thing about 5.3 is that it used to be that if you wanted uh, lumen reflections, you needed to have lumen global illumination. Now you can actually set this to none. I mean, not actually right now because nothing here is baked, but you could set this to none after baking your lighting and you could actually have baked lighting plus lumen reflections, which would be great if the lumen reflections were at the quality that we needed for mirrors and windows. Um, ooh, someone wants to see grooms on metahumans. I think that's the next level. Uh, let me sc scroll the chat really quick while we open up to that next level. Metahuman simple. Not going to save anything I just did. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Does DLSS work out of the box for 5.3 once it's compiled? Yeah. Uh, didn't I set this up with WebXR too? Oh, don't get me started on the WebXR. I, I was so excited about the work that TensorWorks had done for WebXR pixel streaming back in, you know, we started to talk about this a year ago. And uh, they're busy. They're a busy company. who have been doing a lot of other stuff with the pixel streaming side of Unreal. And there's been just about zero progress on the WebXR pixel streaming stuff since February, which is driving me crazy because it's like 90% of the way there to being something usable, but there's like a couple things that need to be fixed regarding like how the image gets stretched over the VR headset. Um, and then also, got to get out of the exposure mode there. Um, and then also the way that um, the, the frame timing is working. So the latency is really jittery, but there are a couple simple things that could be done to fix that. Okay, so we've got a little preview of, you know, where the audience is going to start in Christmas Carol with Dickens here. And so with the groom here, so the groom is working in both eyes. Uh, and the reason for that is because in level blueprints, I've got, you know, not use cards instead of strands. I'm actually using strands. So making sure that that's set up. And I... I'm doing the same thing that I was doing with the Meerkat demo. So I'm setting reflection quality to one, global illumination quality to one, making sure that I've got enough of a, a large enough texture pool, and then things are good. So if I go ahead and press play in here, I get to see Scrooge, and the hair looks amazing. I just want to zoom into the hair. So I can see every individual strand in there in VR, which wasn't the case before. In the past, this would have crashed Unreal, or it would have, um, uh, or it would have just only shown up in one eye. So this is really cool, and the fact that it's like performant, you know, I'm probably getting. I'm curious what it's going to say. I'm getting for frames, but just one metahuman, even at a very high level of detail. I'm surprised it says I'm only getting 25, so that's reprojecting to 50. I guess I'm not moving my head that much, but it feels it feels good. We also have way more lights in the scene right now than we need. Oh, as good as gold and better. Somehow, for MetaHuman Animator, there are some tricks to get the head to use the recorded head rotation and working with the body. I have a couple of videos of this, but I'll also be talking about that more at Unreal Fest. Um, also, check out the Chaos Cloth stuff. So we were using Marvelous Designer in previous productions, and now um, this is all actually happening in Unreal, and it's very performant, and it looks great in VR. It really feels like this is like a little robe. Um, I'm a little nervous about Scrooge 
spreading his legs too much right now. Let me move away from there. But it uh, it looks really good. Feels really good. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Excited about grooms. Excited about all of this. Um, yeah, just watch the shadow show. I kind of love just looking at the shadows and seeing like what that performance looks like. <laughs> uh, and that's it restarting. Oh yeah, we need to find a way to make sure that we freeze physics so that when something like snaps from one spot to another, uh, the, the physics objects like chaos cloth don't go crazy. Um, sorry, and I totally meant to move over to the spectator camera there to match what I'm seeing. Screaming and Much smoother. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, that is that. Uh, and then actually it just occurred to me, I have a whole other project where I can demonstrate the, the reflection stuff better. The errors I'm getting are about whatever um, I'm missing in the blueprint right now for showing text for when we're scaling. Um, there's a couple more things I want to show. Let me just make sure there's nothing else in the chat that I should address here. Uh, see the flashlight. Oh, this would be a great scene to show the flashlight in. Let me do that really quick. Match my cam with the dampened spectator cam. Spawn a pistol. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Yeah, look at that. That's cool. I'll make this pistol a little bit bigger to make the flashlight bigger. Uh, back up a little bit. <laughs> Screaming and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table. Then, in back came up a little bit, the father and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. And now, will little Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold and better. <laughs> yeah, I think if I come over here, it pretty quickly starts to feel more like a horror kind of game, really. Oh, and I think I do still have teleport on. Yeah, I can still teleport. So if I do this now. Yeah, now it feels like there's a murderer over there somewhere. Yeah, just very cool to have these kind of real-time shadows in here. Scrooge does not have physics on. And then um, I don't think... Oh, I guess I do have the sun. The sun is causing some effects in here, so I can make it more nighttimey and just enjoy all the all the glowing happening here. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. And just enjoy some of the reflections. The ghost led him straight to Scrooge's Clark's. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled. Anyways, um, stopped. was going to look more at the chat. Da, 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 da. Um, and uh, MetaQuest Pro, seen, uh, uh, any interest in AI NPC use cases like in world and convi? Yeah, you know what? I've got some time. I'll show you guys what we're one of the things we've got going with in world right now. Christmas Carol with a gun. Yeah. Flashlight in a cave scene would be really cool. Yeah, yeah, someone did something similar with like a flashlight in that kind of cookie and just walking around like a very high poly uh, nanite scene. Really simple, really elegant, um, really great use case for this kind of stuff. Do grooms cast shadows? Ah, great question. I'm glad you brought that up, Adrian, because they do, but I've noticed in VR, there tends to be something weird that happens with them. So I actually do tend to go in and disable the grooms from casting shadows because it does like a weird, the shadows uh, are different in the left versus the right eye. So I actually would go in here and maybe I already did it, but I might've actually disabled cast shadow for the groom. No, actually I have it on at the moment. I guess I wasn't noticing it, but if you do notice that things are happening in a, in a weird way with that, go ahead and disable cast shadow. By the way, easiest way to make your scene more performant, uh, go ahead and do something like window light mixer um, and then just go ahead and like turn off cast shadow for like all your lights. And that's going to make everything work a lot better than before. Um, these lights are set to stationary only because it's part of the, the blueprint that we're using right now for the Dickens house. And I noticed that if I change them all to movable, they'll all actually just snap back to being stationary, which I think still basically becomes movable for all intents and purposes when you uh, are using lumen and nothing is baked. Um, but yeah, let me do, uh, let me do the, the, Dickens um, metahuman thing real quick. Close out of this scene. So that I'll keep building that out and, and sharing the results of that. But here in our in-world demo, check this out. We'll see if it's working. 
because um, I usually test this before we get started. We need to make sure we have like enough credits on our in-world page and all that, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview of what's going to happen if you get a, a ticket to Christmas Carol this year and you come a little bit early and you hang out in the lobby, um, what awaits you besides, you know, your, your fine other audience members. And in-world is certainly a big part of it. So we took um, our incredible lead actor, Ari Tar, and with his permission, we trained uh, 11 labs on his voice. And then we started to build up this character in the in-world interface, which is very much like what we, in a perfect world, would have him physically doing for all of the people who come in to see the show to like introduce them to you know Dickens' home and all that. Um, and it's just great because it means Ari can focus more on meaningful one-on-one -on -one interactions with the audience members and uh, our AI Dickens can give everyone a little bit more of a personal touch. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, which does a great job for um, putting a lot of things on the app as part of this immersive theater experience. So that way, like all the mission stuff and all sorts of like just kind of rote uh, repetitive things are happening on the app, which means that when you are then talking to one of the immersive performers, it feels that much more uh, meaningful and real and engaging. So anyways, let me go ahead and press play and see if this works. You turn up the volume a little bit. Hello, my dear. Can't help but notice how the fog in here is thicker than the mist outside, eh? It's almost as if this place was crafted by the spirits. Do you guys themselves. hear that okay? Is it too quiet? Uh... My dear friend, please do not concern yourself with the volume of my voice, for I am but a humble spirit, and my voice is but a gentle breeze that rustles the leaves of the trees. Charles, uh, can you say hello to the audience watching the show right now? Aye, my dear friend, I bid thee greetings, and may the warmth of this festive season be upon thee. Charles, can you tell us why you wrote Christmas Carol? Uh. My dear friend, I wrote a Christmas Carol as a gift to all, that they may know the joys and sorrows of the season. For in the bleak midwinter there is still hope, and in the darkness there is still light. <laughs> what happened? Oh my God. <laughs> Fear not, my dear friend, for all is well. The spirits of Christmas have come to guide thee on thy journey. Audio is good, great. Uh, ask him a maths question. Uh, Charles, can you tell me what 5,000 divided by two is? Uh. My dear friend, a simple arithmetic question indeed. Why, 5,000 divided by two is of course 2,500. Ooh. <laughs> Charles, can you tell me who Agile Lens is? <laughs> My dear friend, Agile Lens is a most wondrous and clever group of individuals who have brought this virtual world to life. This they are architects. Oh, sorry. I uh, meant to... Uh, only be talking to the chat and not to you, Charles. Uh, yes, he says lots of nice things about Agile Lens. That's great. How are you, Charles? Ah, my dear friend, it is a pleasure to make thy acquaintance, Emerald. May the blessings of the season be upon thee. Ah, my dear friend, I am well. Thank thee for asking. The spirit of Christmas has filled my heart with joy and gladness. How may I assist thee on this most wondrous journey? Charles, I'm curious if you could compose a poem to me in your own style that confronts the juxtaposition of the founder of the atomic bomb and the Mattel toy Barbie. Aye, my dear friend, a most intriguing request indeed. A tale of two creations so vastly different. One, a force of nature, a power to be reckoned. The other, a toy, a plaything, a symbol of beauty. Yet in their own ways, both have changed the world we see. The atom, a building block of all that's around. A force both fierce and gentle, a mystery profound. While Barbie, a symbol of femininity, a toy, a reflection of society's ideals, a mirror to the soul. 
Two creations so vastly different, yet the same, both shaping our world in their own unique way. Charles, can you tell me a little bit about where this world came from? My dear friend, this world, this virtual realm, a creation of wonder, of magic, of dreams. It is a place where the imagination runs free, where the boundaries of reality are but a distant memory. The place where we may all be who we wish to be. And where are we right now? <laughs> My dear friend, we are in a chamber, a place of to play. My dear friend, thou art most kind. May the blessings of the season be upon thee, and may thy heart be filled with joy and gladness. Charles, where are we right now? Ah. Uh, my dear friend, we are in a chamber, a place of warmth, of comfort, of joy, a place where the spirits of Christmas gather to play, to laugh, to sing, to dance, and to enjoy. Whoops. Cool. Uh, anyone have a question they want to ask Charles Dickens? <laughs> oh, wow. My dear friend, ask away, I shall answer thee to the best of my ability. Charles, how's the weather right now? Ah. My dear friend, the weather thou asketh. Why, it is a cold, crisp night, with snowflakes gently falling, a night perfect for a warm cup of cocoa, and a good book by the fire. Is it snowing? Ooh, seems like a, the kind of weather where you'd want to curl up with a cat and, and stroke it, right? Ah. My dear friend, thou art most wise, a Catan, a most excellent companion on a cold winter's night. A creature so soft, so warm, so gentle, a comfort in the coldest of times. Ah. My dear friend, I see thou hast a kind heart, a heart that loves the creatures great and small. For I myself have had a feline friend, a cat named Bob, a creature most wondrous, most loyal, most true. Well, Charles, this has been a wonderful conversation. I think we should celebrate. Could we have a toast? Ah, my dear friend, a toast, thou sayest. Why, it would be my honor, my pleasure, my joy to raise a glass to thee, to us, to this night to the spirits of Christmas, and to the magic of the night. Do you have any champagne? Ah, uh, my dear friend, champagne, thou askest. Why, tis a drink most bubbly, most refreshing, most divine, a drink fit for kings and queens and all who doth celebrate the joys, <laughs> the wonders, the magic of this night. That was trippy. Where'd he go? <laughs> He's back. Never seen that before. He does not speak Spanish. Yeah, unfortunately. We, and we've heard people complain My about dear friend. in World AI regarding the, um, the accents and how uh, they do not handle accents well or accents or other languages, but we'll get there. Uh, cool. Anyways, uh, let me see if there's anything else on my list that I wanted to make sure that I demonstrated for you regarding... 5.3. Oh, I've got that other project um, where I just want to show in here a, a little bit better of an example of the, the rendering stuff I'm talking about. Oh, it's got to recompile. 5.3 DLSS. That's fine. You know what? I'll just open it up here while it's compiling. Definitely a good idea. Okay. So this is generally how I try to set up these demos where I want to start people in kind of a simple environment um, for 5.3 in this case. And in this one, I do have a bunch of 
uh, mirrors. And in this one, I also, instead of the um, scaling, the tilt brush stuff, I've just got like a fly mode. And so the fly mode is kind of a nice way to get around. And you can see we've got a mirror here and a mirror over here, and it does reflect back and forth. But you see that I also have to keep the quality relatively low in order for it to not look um, clearly wrong. Oh, here we go. It's opening up over here. So if I start to crank up the quality settings, we see the reflection gets better, 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 and I'll even go to ultra quality. And this looks really good, nice and sharp. But if I were to look at anything that is glass, um, then we'd have some trouble I'm flying around, flying around. I do have the flashlight on both of these. Look at that glowing. And yeah, I'll try to see if I can find some glass to, to demonstrate what I was talking about. Uh, this one, I think, in this demo, this one does chrome balls. Oop. Yeah. Yeah, so just to demonstrate a little bit more of what I was saying, it's really cool how, look, I can zoom in really close here, and I can see myself, and I can see the weapons, and I can see the clouds behind me. It's just, that's kind of the most amazing thing to me about Lumen and NI. Now, this really simple thing where you have all these real-time reflections, this real-time emissive illumination, and it all runs uh, very, very well, even now on lower-end hardware. Okay, let me um, load up the hillside photogrammetry model. And again, this is another demo you can download and try on your own, too. So I'm doing that with Spacebar, and I can fly around to look at the photogrammetry and say, wow, look at all this detail. This was done by a bunch of drone photography, so it is actually kind of useful to look at it from higher up. So this is what, what was actually built for Habitat 67 compared to the original vision, which you see in the hillside sample. Uh, and, I'll hit, and there we go. Actually, this is pretty cool. So you can see the reflection bounces. You can see what looks like a bunch of Habitat 67s in the mirrors there going back and back and back and back. So that's, that's really nice. Um, so... Now, if I add in all the a bunch of the Matrix City sample buildings, we see all the light being cast from them. We see all this detail over here. I can toggle Nanite on and off pretty easily. Notice that Nanite does not show up in reflections, but I can just kind of appreciate the level of detail we get when we get really close to this stuff. And then how it becomes simpler as you get further away. Um, what was I doing here? I just wanted to find... Oh, yeah, there are some weird artifacts in the uh, the reflections. You'll notice it looks like the buildings are, like, being constructed as I get closer. I've tried maximizing a bunch of the different uh, distances, anything that uses the word distance, and I haven't quite been able to solve that, so I'm curious if anyone else manages to figure that out. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to find anywhere where we've got glass. Maybe glass facing other glass. I should have already thought about like a particular place for this. Actually, it's just going to be easiest to do in the project. So anyway, that's a cool little demo you can check out at your leisure. Um, but I do just want to demonstrate the glass problem briefly, uh, especially because if anyone thinks they might have like a fix for it, then that would be amazing. So let's do this. Let's go just a basic level. And we're going to build this up really, really fast. We're going to grab a cube. And we're just going to make, whoops, we're going to make a couple of them glass. Burp. Remember that the uh, the end key on the keyboard will snap something to the ground, which is always really handy. And I'm going to scale this up to be like a big, big wall. So we're imagining this is like a window pane, right? And then we've got to have, you know, some stuff out in the middle. I mean, what the heck, I'll, I'll literally just drag in one of the city sample buildings. Uh, da, 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 da. Drag, drag, drag. Don't crash. There we go. Okay. All right. So this is something that, um, oh, it's like a bunch of pieces, or it's still kind of constructing itself. But let's just drop this, even as it's, even as it's being constructed, like right in the middle here. Okay. So if these are both glass, right, you'd want like a good reflection of what this looks like. Um, and so if we turn these into glass, glass, building glass maybe, maybe building glass is okay. Seems like a lot of different versions of that. Um, we can't quite, I don't think that's a, a proper glass because it's not translucent. Let's make sure it's a glass that isn't glowing right now. Glass, 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 glass. Can, can I subtract the word? Um, there we go. Glass clear. 
Yeah, I mean, we should be able to see some level of reflectivity here. I mean, we might just have to build a glass material real fast. There it is. Okay, so here we go. We've got some like crappy reflections happening. Let me save this map really quick. Glass. And uh, we don't have a post-process volume, so I'll do really quickly the same thing I did before. Post process volume. And we're just going to watch this improve very quickly. Infinite extents unbound. Lumen. Yes. Reflections. Yes. Whatever. Quality. Yes. Ray lighting mode. Uh, hit reflections. Oh, and did I make it infinite? I thought I made it infinite. It, it did, yeah. Uh, high quality translucency reflections. So this is translucent, right? Boop. There we go. Okay. So that's starting to do something cool. Um, I could be smoothing this out, but like at its core, like this is approaching something that I would start to be comfortable with using instead of ray traced reflections. Um, let me just make sure that everything else is cranked up as high as I want it to be. You know, let's add some extra reflection bounces. Let's um, have everything here cranked up as high as it will go. Though keep in mind, a lot of times when you see sliders in Unreal, they're more of suggestions than, than actual rules. Um, and you usually can go above some of these elements. Yeah, the bigger doesn't necessarily mean better for all these things, but okay. I've got a very high quality lumen scene and it's looking pretty good here, but now let me go ahead and rotate these. So I've got some glass in other directions too. Sure, a little bit of an angle, why not? Scale it. And watch what happens when I go into VR. Save all. VR preview. By the way, I am so, so happy that now you can... Yeah, well, it's it's not so... That, that, for uh, what Niall's asking about dragging a level into another level, that's intentionally supposed to be for packed level actors. You can grab any geometry in your scene and right-click it and do level... Uh, create packed level actor and then it becomes like this nice almost like blueprint that has all this other geometry in it But then it's cool because you can edit it and start to adjust it and then have it propagate to everything else um, Anyways, let me um, oh getting some thunder over here Let me go ahead and I just wanted to shout out I love 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 that I think this was starting with 5.2 that this is now like a hot swappable detection, a plug and play kind of thing, where it used to be that if you booted up Unreal Engine and your headset died or shut down or it wasn't connected, VR preview would be grayed out. Now, as long as your OpenXR hasn't changed from like Oculus to Steam, um, this will go from gray to active when you plug in your headset. I would do it right now, but I'm nervous about this headset being about to die, but that will go from gray to on and it's really cool and wonderful and saves a ton of time. Let me press play. Okay. I'm inside the building. Fun. Let me um, go ahead and toggle my fly mode. We up. Oh, that's my teleport mode. Fly. Okay. So here's the problem. So at a glance, this seems like it's doing what we want, right? You, what you guys are seeing is a reflection of the building. However, if I do VR dot spectator screen mode two, you will see I am getting a different view in my left and my right eye, and that makes me very sad because what I see in the left eye, like there's a lot of instances where that would be acceptable for what I see through glass um, if we could get that over to the right eye, but we can't. Okay, <laughs> complaining over. Uh, all right, I think that is pretty much everything that I wanted to demonstrate for today. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, I am very thirsty. Let me take a drink of the water I've had sitting here the whole time, and I'm gonna look at my notes to see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, chaos physics look really good in VR. Oh, virtual reality, uh, the virtual scouting template. That's a, a cool one as well. Um, slowing down time in VR is really fun. Anytime you uh, do that, things can be really, really neat. Let me actually just really quickly open up our to, 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 uh, virtual scouting project I'll do. And we've got our rage room project, which I could show. Um, let me, let me find, let me find really quickly. I'm going to show two more things and answer some questions, then call it a day. So thank you everyone for spending, hanging out this whole time. This is definitely a longer live stream than I was expecting to do, but I'm having fun and you're all great. And again, I just, I love the community. Um, so yeah, let me show virtual scouting for anyone who has an interest in virtual production and all that. And let me also show my, what is it? My geo collection test, my projectile testing. I think it's this projectile tests VR. Okay. So I already did a, a bit of a uh, YouTube tutorial series. These are the most recent things on my channel. But um, I do just want to shout out a couple things about how this looks in VR because it's really neat. Um, 
someone needs to, needs to make a mirror maze in VR. Yeah, uh, yes, I agree, Niall. Um, once the mirror quality reflection and all the bounces can look good enough and work in both eyes. Um, yes, there's lots to absorb here. Bye, Carlos. Have a great weekend. Uh, drag a level, pre-built buildings, if you sample stuff. Is there any reflection on that glass material? Yeah, I think, uh, refraction. Is there any refraction? Yes. Um, oh, that's another thing I should point it out is, so under refraction, you have the options of raster or ray tracing. Ray tracing, you are only going to see in one eye uh, in 5.3 right now, which wasn't the case previously. Like ray tracing would work in both eyes. And, um, oh, what happened? Did I freeze? No, I'm still here. Uh, and raster uh, works in both eyes, but it isn't as good. So yes, um, refraction is not as great as it could be. Um, cool, yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, you've been stuck. Mega Steak Man's been stuck in 5.1 for months. Uh, it's a tough place to be. We've been stuck in 4.27 for a lot of our projects. Uh, come on, project. Open up, open up, open up. I want to also start up the virtual scouting template, but I'm afraid of it taking too long. Okay. Let me just give you a quick demonstration of what's going on in here. So when I open this guy up, I want to grab, oop, I'm a little bit too far away or it's like right where my table is. Let me, uh, I guess I could go back around to the other side or just back up a little. There we go. Okay, so right now the, it's compiling shaders, but I've done like a proper chaos destruction setup on here. So these pieces actually will, you know, hit things. And I can have these like nice little slow motion bits of destruction. And I've got slow motion triggering whenever particular destruction happens. And it feels really good. Like this is a really simple template scene. I'll be putting all this on uh, GitHub soon. And we're also going to start adding some other elements from our old Rage Room experience where we start to mix up things like um, things being able to catch fire, things being able to um, have other kinds of things happen to them. Fire, wetness, uh, uh, destruction in general. But this, I, the reason I'm showing this to you guys now as part of my 5.3 stream is this was the kind of thing that would crash all the time for me in, uh, in 5.2 and before. It feels much more stable in 5.3. And it's just really fun to see all this destruction literally bring down. Oh yeah, look, I can even like make them collide with each other if I'm careful about it. Anyways, that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, that's chaos destruction. I guess what I really just want to show you is like, look what I can do, and it's not crashing. This definitely would have crashed before. You know, typically when you do lost up with chaos destruction, you would want to um, make sure that you are, you know, making sure that all this stuff comes to rest fairly quick. You want to use caching as much as possible. And the fact that this is all real time and not crashing, I think is just a testament to this all becoming a lot more stable than it was before. Right? And then I just want to be able to like, pick it up. Game Dev Micah and I were chatting about uh, what it would take to then be able to go one step further with this and be able to like grab it and uh, grab all the pieces and they all have their own little grab components and, you know, how fun that would be. Like we'd probably have like a minimum size in order to pick stuff up. But, you know, stuff like this where stuff like never quite comes to rest, that's the kind of thing that would be like a garbage collection problem and really start to destroy Unreal Engine eventually. And it's not really a problem anymore. You can see there's a couple objects where I did not enable gravity. So they'll just continue to float off into space uh, forever. Okay, <laughs> that's that. Chaos destruction, very fun. Um, yeah, and then I'm going to go ahead and show you the virtual scouting template, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, lip syncing of AI NPCs, events based on dialogue. Yeah, so in World AI, uh, speaking to Niall's question in the chat, there's there's so many cool things you can do in the interface where you start to break down character traits and their history and how they respond to certain things. And then you can literally have like blueprint events inside Unreal that actually trigger different things to happen. Uh, Con Conva AI integrates with NVIDIA Omniverse and you get the value of audio to face and audio streaming with AI NPC voices. Um, Yes, yes. I mean, I'm not a spokesperson for in-world, but uh, I think probably they seem to be expanding very quick. I've never played with Conva AI. Is there a good Unreal Engine plugin for it? Because that would be cool. Uh, okay, last project, last project for the day. I'm gonna go eat something and prepare for, 
Oops, no, it's not, that's not even the right thing. Uh, and then I'm going to prepare for all the fun people who are going to be visiting me this weekend. <laughs> we have a, an annual get-together of my college uh, theater group, which was called What? The Warehouse Architecture Theater over at Syracuse. And it was always a good time. I don't want to be in GitHub. Uh, so we're going to do some fun things this weekend and talk about VR theater. None of them are doing VR theater. I'm the only one from my old college troupe involved with this stuff. But it's been cool to, to keep them apprised of it all. Um, I really liked being in a college theater troupe, by the way, the fact that we like wrote our own plays and we'd rehearse at like 3 a.m. in the morning in the architecture studio. And we had like a very wide range of different audiences, including, of course, our, our stingy architecture professors. And we did everything from like, yeah, David Ive shows to our original shows to like Picasso with Le Pana Gilles, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, oh, I think I know why this is crashing. I tried to enable the XR Scribe plugin in here, and I notice it seems to be a little bit unstable. And I think it, it doesn't play nicely with some other plugin, and everything kind of causes it to crash when that happens. So let me just go ahead and, and disable XR Scribe, and I bet it won't crash when it opens now. Boop. Because this is literally just the uh, the virtual production template. This comes with the virtual scouting uh, plugin already enabled, and then I just enabled um, XR Scribe because I was going to try something out with it. Didn't get a chance, but then now they see that it's crashing. I think the XR Scribe plugin is what is crashing it. So let's see if it is okay or if it crashes again. Oh, it crashed again. Okay, whatever. Let's just do it. Um, although, you know what? Let me show you guys really quickly something I've been doing more and more of. Uh, I mean, I know we're all talking about ChatGPT these days, but like having ChatGPT diagnose why Unreal Engine is crashing, really, really handy. Uh, even for newer versions of Unreal. Let me try that real quick. I'm just going to say, hey, um, ChatGPT, here's a crash. Any idea what's going on? I didn't even say, you know, here's my Unreal Engine crash. Uh, let's see what it actually says is going on here. Do, 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 do. This is a call stack related to a crash that occurred within the Unreal Editor, presumably Unreal Engine 5. Oh, it even knows I'm in 5. Uh, in the program attempted access a memory location it wasn't allowed to. Quick analysis of the call stack. While that's happening, by the way, we'll, we'll let it do its little analysis. And I'll just go ahead and create a new uh, 5.3 um, virtual scouting template. But it is, I always learn so much just throwing like raw, you know, crash data at ChatGPT and seeing what it gives me back. Seems like the crash may have been triggered when the viewport received focus. Like, see, that's really interesting. Uh, the get cursor calls, bring some steps you could take, check custom code, reproduce, you know. <laughs> interesting. One thing I like about crashing in Unreal versus Unity is Unity always makes you fill out like a bug report uh, anytime something crashes. And it's like, I don't have time for this uh, versus Unreal. It's like, yeah, it's great if you do fill that out, but they are still going to get useful data just by sending and restarting. And it's much, much faster. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, games, uh, not games, film and video, virtual production. So it mentions that it has like VR scouting and all that. Um, let me just say VR scout. Test, five, three, create. And we'll take a quick look at some of the stuff happening in here. So I was a huge fan of the VR editor in Unreal. And if you dive back through my YouTube channel, there's all sorts of times when I was like, yay, the VR editor, which eventually became VR mode. It was a thing that basically allowed you to operate most of Unreal Engine from in within VR. You could scale up, scale down a lot like the tilt brush controls. You could pull like materials onto objects. You could set up like sequencer cameras and all sorts of fun things like uh, activating physics simulations. And then I guess because I was the only person using it or something, it just kind of died. Like it, it no longer was a thing. Uh, and so uh, now it's it's pretty much dead. Like I think if you really want to use the proper um, VR mode, you maybe can get it to work in like 5.1, but really you want to go back to like 4.27. Yeah, so VR editor, as it was called, became VR mode. That's not a thing anymore. This is the closest thing that is still a successor to all that is the VR scouting tools in VR. And I don't know why it's taking long for these shaders to compile when it's exactly the same project as the one I just had open. Um, but yeah, uh, what you'll see in here is some really cool little tools for setting up like lights and cameras and dolly tracks. And I figure because I'm just trying to talk about everything working with VR 
in 5.3. This is a good little note to end it on. Um, I'm not doing a lot of virtual production work right now. I'd love for Agile Lens to be doing more virtual production work. Um, if anyone has any leads, especially for anything in New York City, it's a fun adjacent world to ours. And we're learning more and more about end display and Omniverse and all that. So, you know, keep us uh, updated if you see anything that you think we should be working on. But here we go, it's opening up. And I'll just show you a little bit of some of the tools in here, which are a really cool way to start to, you know, scout out uh, something like a set. Um, yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys were also disappointed about the VR editor being removed. It was really cool. Yeah, to open up like the foliage tool or the landscaping tool and just be like, blah, cliffs, blah, trees and rocks and bushes and high grass uh, was really cool. And it's, it's sad that that's just not a thing anymore. We can see right here, this is the virtual reality mode and I'm just going to literally click it. So it's different, of course, from VR preview. And so I've just opened this up. This is the blank project. And yes, see you in the replay later. Thanks, Frontera. I'm almost done here too. You guys have all been great hanging out with me for over two hours now. I'm gonna hit VR virtual reality mode. Oh, unable to initialize VR scouting. What's going on there? Um, VR propagate alpha must be set to zero and requires an engine restart. That's interesting. So that seems like a bug because <laughs> it should work out of the box. Uh, post processing, uh, custom distance levels. I have no idea what it uh, even said that was. Propagate alpha must be set to zero. So do I literally just have to make that like a CVAR in the uh, in the any? Hmm. Hmm. Requires an engine restart. Okay. Well, I mean, let me let me see if that's actually true. Let me try like literally just typing it. And whoops. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay, if you can hear me, this is just me kind of saying goodbye now. Uh, that's what I was saying when I realized I was talking, but my headset was my microphone, so you couldn't hear me at all. Uh, so obviously it's not working out of the box with 5.3. I could probably make this a separate video or a little live stream in itself. So plan on me doing that once I figure out um, what's going on. And uh, anyways, this was fun to hang out with you all. Thanks very much. And uh, I hope to see you guys in a future chat. Say hi on Twitter, say hi on YouTube, say hi on LinkedIn. Um, hopefully I'll do more of these in the future because I really do like sharing this knowledge and helping people who are getting started in this space or intermediate but running into weird bugs. Um, so stay in touch. And uh, yeah, next time we'll see if we can get the out of the box virtual production VR scouting template to work with friggin' VR. Um, I'll talk to the ethics team about that. Anyway, hope to see some of you at Unreal Fest. I don't know why I'm taking so long to say goodbye. I'm a little bit tired. I've been sleeping like four hours this whole week, but you're all great, fantastic. Goodbye, thank you. <laughs>